Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Thursday, December 6, 2021, my 9th. My name is Emma Vigeland in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning majority report. You know, the nine is just the six, upside down. We are broadcasting live as steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Matthew Stewart, author of the 99%, or the 9.9%, wow, it's not my day thus far, the new aristocracy that is entrenching inequality and warping our culture. Meanwhile, two Senate Democrats, John Tester and Joe Manchin, of course, joined Senate Republicans yesterday in voting to overturn Biden's vaccine mandate that isn't like a mandate. It has testing for private businesses. Luckily, the bill has to go to the House and Democratic leadership doesn't even expect to dignify it with a vote. So the holy pontiff parliamentarian is expected to make her decree on immigration reform known shortly as house progressives encourage the senate to overrule their built-in excuse you'd need to get all 50 democrats on that so it's gonna be tough the house also voted 428 to 1 the lone vote for no was the republican thomas massey to ban imported products from Xinjiang over the Chinese prosecution of Muslim ethnic minorities, but we still have not gotten that censure vote on Boebert's Islamophobia. Interesting. This also comes as the UK and Canada join the US in a diplomatic boycott of the 2022 Beijing Olympics. Former Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows has decided to sue Nancy Pelosi and the January 6th committee hours after a criminal contempt of Congress referral was filed against him. A best, the best offense is a good defense or no, best defense is a good offense. That's what I meant. And lastly, the 16 year Angela Merkel era is officially over in Germany. It was an era marked by austerity and wage and labor suppression. Olaf Scholz of the center-left Social Democratic Party was sworn in as German Chancellor yesterday after successfully forming a government with the Green Party and the Liberals. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully I got all of my uh, my Samisms out of the way where I say things wrong. That's, you know. Yeah, a lot of people don't know. Uh, Emma preps by hanging upside down like a vampire bat from the ceiling so she has (laughs) troubles with the sixes and the nines yep uh it's it's how i basically sleep as well it's i incubate um so i'm looking forward to our discussion in a little bit um but we, we we like to start off the show sometimes with serious clips but sometimes with silly clips and just sometimes bat no pun intended based on my sleeping patterns clips this is one of those tucker carlson uh spoke with former brexit party leader nigel farage on his daytime show the other day nigel doesn't even get the uh the nighttime the nighttime portion but this is this is where tucker kind of launders his craziest stuff uh also you know you'll you'll see guests that he doesn't feel are primetime guests but uh have the ability to heighten the insanity level of the conversation and so he'll plug this uh fox nation show on his nighttime show and he, he's able to maintain I, I don't even know what respectability he might have but the just trust me the even crazier stuff is said on this daytime show yeah, it's trucker uh, t- uh, tucker's true heart mm-hmm. uh it's where he has like charles murray on and stuff like that right um and so 
here he is with Nigel Farage talking about Prime Minister of the UK, Boris Johnson, um, and basically critiquing him from on COVID from the right. And Tucker has a interesting theory on why Boris Johnson isn't living up to his own COVID denying standards. Leadership qualities. Yes. We're going to go, yes. We're going to go and climb that hill. And here's why we want to do it. And we invite you, the public, to come with us on that journey. Amen. That is leadership. And Boris, just with the best will in the world, doesn't have that. And we've seen more U turns in policy from the Johnson government than I've seen in any government in my lifetime. Yes. And uh, in a very embarrassing way. Oh, some of it's been shocking. So somebody who knows him told me, and I, I should be initially getting your take on this. Uh, I just love the concept of a, a U turn in an embarrassing way. Oh, would we be even more embarrassing than driving on the right side of the road. Mm. I, I love the idea that U-turns are this just damning thing for a politician to uh, undertake, particularly during a pandemic of a novel virus. Yeah, it, it, it's it's almost like when you take in new data, you might change your position. That's nuts. You react to, to events on the ground. And, you know, when you're a Tory, it's tough because you're, you know, um, degenerate <laughs> aristocracy. But... You do the best job you can, and I think Boris should deserve support again from these, just from these kind of creeps. Yeah, I mean, but B Boris, Boris maybe went a little too far for them in in you know he dresses up like he pretends to be one of the men of the people. Oh, I'll wear a police outfit. Any excuse for me to to break out the accent, but we we go go back a little. Um, yeah. Government in my lifetime. Yes. And uh, in a very embarrassing way. Oh, some of it's been shocking. So somebody who knows him told me, and I, I should be initially getting your take on this, that getting COVID emasculated him. It changed oh. him. It, we, it feminized him. It weakened him as a man. Do you think that's... Well, I think he was very seriously ill. Oh, for uh, sure he was. And I think... I mean, one, one of the things we have learned from COVID is people who are 50, 60, 70, 80 pounds overweight uh, tend to have fared very badly. Sure. Now, we don't talk about it But much. the virus itself, this is true, does tend to take away the life force in some people, I notice. I mean, it does yes. feminize people. I, I'm, no one ever says that, but it, it's true. I, look, I think the virus did affect him, but I think, let's be honest about it, it's, it's the new wife, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's you know, oh! Carrie Johnson, or as, as she's now called, Carrie Antoinette, <laughs> uh, which the, the historians <laughs> like. Um, uh, this is a very powerful, very strong woman. Uh, with what wife is this, do we know? Or do uh, we even uh, keep count? I don't... Well, that's not the... So, I mean, it could be his wife. It could be his wife that's feminizing him just like her, but I mean, she, uh, you might call her a novel virus in and of herself. Sorry, the, COVID does have some side effects. Like, I, I'm pretty sure, like, impotence and, and infertility is one of those. And um, There's so a fear that men are going to do the long COVID. We don't know since, sorry to cut you off, but we don't know since it's a, no it's a novel virus. There is a fear that there's the sperm count is going to be irreparably lowered. Yeah, like that's an important reason to get vaccinated, actually, if, mm -hmm. if you know, for like future family planning purposes, if you're a male. Um, and I'd also just, what was the other thing? Um, oh, crap, I lost my train of thought. No, it's okay. I mean, he, he basically, what, what stuck out to me there is... Um, for Tucker Carlson, if you're weakened, if you lose weight, you're female. Life force is what he described as what is taken from you when you get COVID. By While well, the entire time Tucker Carlson is saying, I'm not telling you not to get vaccinated, but here's why it would be incredibly yeah. dangerous for you to get vaccinated. Put that aside. Like, the idea, people are pointing out the absurdity of these comments, of course, um, but there is... I, the the underlying like ho homophobia oh. and sexism in it is unbelievable well, life force is inherently male so like life is to tucker carlson i mean he said the term life force is is a male enterprise he's recoding the symptoms of getting this virus for in this like homophobic and uh, misogynistic way right um like the long covid symptoms where you feel uh, you know like i don't know if people don't know people with long covid but 
I, I was talking to people around Thanksgiving. My mom knows three people that have long COVID and they just mentally, they're in a fog. Like that's not something I associate with femininity. Yeah. <laughs> that's like a, some neurological thing happening because you had a crazy virus attack your nervous system. And But that, you don't associate it with femininity because you are not a- I guess I don't. Raisin sexist. I right. mean, like yeah. the people that are active, the people that are making things happen, that's inherently male to somebody like Tucker Carlson. And even Farage was trying to steer the conversation away from COVID is feminizing you. And then let's not, let's also be clear. This fits perfectly in what Tucker Carlson has been trying to say for such a long time that the United States, like it doesn't, it doesn't fit because it doesn't make any goddamn sense. But Tucker's other, you know, big project has been the United States is becoming feminized. Men can't be men anymore. This was him, right? About the Chinese, uh, the the Chinese military. They don't have any confusion about who's a man and who's not, and they're going to be taking over the country because of this. So, like, he ties in, you know, uh, nationalism with his concept of masculinity, with uh, yeah. But it's also it's also contradictory because apparently it was supposed to just be the flu. And you were supposed to be able to get over it. And they were all cheering Trump on for essentially getting COVID and saying that it wasn't that big of a deal. I guess, you know, Trump's Trump's almost a woman. Yeah. You know, Ella, when, I did, when I had swine flu back in the day, I did really get in touch with my feminine side over that weekend. So did you paint your nails? Yeah. Paint my nails. Watch some sex in the city. But there, there could be something to it. I uh, Yeah, I accidentally got spoiled. Somebody shared a meme, uh, and I ha it's like the, the, the new Sex and City just came out. Please don't share memes with spoilers in it. All right, we are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to be joined by Matthew Stewart, author of the 9.9%, the new aristocracy that is entrenching inequality and warping our culture. Quick break. Be right back. We are back and we are joined by Matthew Stewart, author of the 9.9%, the new aristocracy that is entrenching inequality and warping our culture. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm excited to talk about your book because I would imagine that you get this all the time. When I initially read the title, I thought that it said the 99%. Because, you know, just of the language that we've been that that we've we've been engaging in since Occupy or the Bernie Sanders campaign as well, we're kind of taught to see income inequality as the one percent versus the ninety nine percent, which is helpful when you're just starting to think about inequality. But I, your book slices the pie in a different way with the tippy tippy top, but then the nine point nine percent and then the rest of us. So take us through that initial calculus if you could yeah so there's there's a couple of things that are not quite right about that usual story um and one is the math i'll go through that but there's a there's a deeper point which is that it kind of frames inequality about uh, as a as an issue to do with them just a crazy small number of super rich people um and they are part of the problem but the, but the math points in a different way and that's that was my um goal was to use the math to, to change the frame so the math looks like this. Um, over the last 50 years, there's been a huge increase in uh, economic inequality. We all know that. We're back to where we were in 1928. Um, but it turns out that all that increase happened in the uh, top 0.1%, all the relative increase in wealth. Uh, and it also turns out that not everybody down below lost. So it was the bottom 90% who uh, ended up uh, basically yielding to that top 0.1%. 
And then in between you have, do the math, it's 9.9%. And that group turns out to be the wealthiest collectively in our society. So if, if we had a dollar to give to the rich guy and we, we would basically give a dollar to the 90%, so that's sort of 900 people on one side and one on the other, each with a dollar. That group in the in the middle, the 9.9 percent or in the upper middle, uh, would get two dollars and fifty cents, um, and it's held steady over the last 50 years. Um, but as I say, the main point is to kind of change the frame a bit because it's not that everybody. Rem uh, uh, um, the issue is that our society is really organized around people making it into the 9.9%. That's kind of the, the American dream. And that dream has really changed. So I'll give you one other piece of the math that's important. And that's that um, uh, if you look at the ratio in wealth between the 9.9% and the 90%, 50 years ago, that was about 10 to 1, roughly. That's how much you'd have to increase your wealth to move from the middle of the pack of American society to this top group. Um, and now it's 24 times. Uh, and my, my basic argument, I spend a whole book on it, is that when you change the math at that, at that fundamental level, it changes our lives in, in a lot of ways. It changes the way we think. Um, and that you know, helps us figure out why it is that we're having so much difficulty um, facing so many crises, but also having so much difficulty addressing obvious problems. Yeah, I mean, this kind of centers on some of my frustrations with, I think, you know, I'm in favor of a wealth tax, for example, but there is this like very, just targeting billionaires or just targeting the very top, which I want to do as a supplement is insufficient because of this like very insular top 9.9% you know, group that you reference here. And you mentioned how it's largely, uh, well, it, it's been incredibly durable for the past 50 years. Tell us a little bit about how this group kind of codified itself. So there, it, it's one of these things that's uh, it, it's kind of obvious if you look around you, but most people don't really take the time to look. And in a way, that's the issue, right? It's the invisibility of how it all happens. Um, but one area in which it clearly happens is in our uh, in our neighborhood system and our, our you know the way we divide up the real estate world, right? So what a, a defining um, attribute of the of the membership or the people who make it into this elect group in American society is the people who live in the right neighborhoods and basically have homes that are appreciated um, in value. Um, and uh, I think we like to interpret that as just kind of like the tides rising, it's inevitable, what's the way the market works. But it's actually a lot more complicated and there's a lot more um, complicity in that because in fact, those neighborhoods are often good precisely because the people in them have the political power to, uh, to restrain development, to, um, to use zoning laws to keep people out. Um, and in fact, you know, in the big scheme of things, they've been successful in, in, um, in keeping people out, driving the prices up and creating a very divided society. Um, it's also been important with racial division, educational division. That's just one part of the story. Then there's this educational component, which is really important, where we've managed to create a society in which if you can go through the right channels and basically are born to the right kinds of families, you can go through a certain educational system that will enhance your prospects. Uh, and if not, you will, you will either not get a higher education or you will get an expensive one that will put you in debt and keep you um, on the other side. Um, there are also important cultural uh, differences, you know, the um, attitudes towards raising uh, families in particular um, that have uh, sort of distinguished this group. But um, all of these things, I think, have kind of crept up on us slowly. And more than we appreciate, they are uh, they're really consequences of rising inequality. I mean, I think we often tell the story in reverse. We think, well, we're so smart that we've made ourselves wealthier as a special group. But the reality is more that the money appeared largely through structural problems in the way our economy is organized. Um, and then we came up with rationalizations for it later. Yeah. Um, I, I, you meant, you touched on a, a bit there, but the um, child raising kind of as a sport uh, dynamic is something I'd love to, to talk about now, because I really did appreciate how you, you both have this, you have the scientific like mathematical approach to this, but also kind of a sociological focus on, on uh, this particular group uh, and, and what characterizes them. So it's easily identifiable outside of the bank number or the, the, uh, the wealth accumulation because 
that culture of parenting, I mean, it was it's something I certainly recognized, and that was your focus in chapter two. Tell us a little bit about uh, that 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 part of your book. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I I came into this project really from two very different angles. Uh, one is that I was uh, studying the Civil War, the, the struggle over slavery. So that was, and I saw an oligarchy there. I saw the story of inequality, and then uh, that's completely irrelevant to your question. The other angle, though, was parenting. So I was involved in this um, parenting race, um, and it was uh, it struck me as being profoundly insane. Um, I mean, the, the things that people are going through to, you know, get their kids into the, you know, national fencing competition and, um, you know, to, to curate every experience of their lives and to protect them from all, all conceivable risks. I mean, some of it, some of it can be helpful to kids, but a lot of it just clearly isn't. A lot of it's driven by this, um, overwhelming anxiety. Uh, so that's what drew me into it, and there's a there's a pretty short and simple analysis that I think explains most of it, not everything. Um, it turns out that if you uh, look at the sociological evidence across countries, uh, countries that have high inequality tend to develop these kinds of extreme parenting practices, um, and then countries where there's a, a, a greater degree of equality or a higher sense of fairness, the parents. Um, take a somewhat more relaxed attitude. Um, I don't think that means that they, they're, they're, they're bad parents. I just think it, it means that they, they, they don't feel that intense pressure to make sure that the kids um, move ahead. Uh, and I, I guess the, the final really important aspect of this is that for a small group of people in our society, it, it can make sense. So if you are in that 9.9%, maybe in the top two or 3%, you can afford the, um, everything you need for supreme parenting. You know, you can get the nanny and maybe you can pay for the private school and you can buy that, you know, um, educational holiday in the Galapagos or whatever it is that, that you need to make sure that the little one is the perfect child. Uh, but it's pretty unrealistic for most of American society. And that the problem is that a huge part of American society is bought into that value system, but they don't have the money to pay for it. And there's this kind of unwillingness to recognize that we're, we're setting up a model that's supposed to work, you know, in some fantasy land, but won't actually work in, in real life. There's also just, I mean, to me, the, the narcissism of it is a little, a, a little perplexing. Like, my child needs to be the perfect, you know, it, there's a striving, and that's why I guess you can categorize it as an aristocracy in that, in that uh, sliver of the population. Like, that there is like this idea to not just keep up with the Joneses, but to present th this, your child almost as a, uh, uh, a human trophy of your, your wealth or your status, I guess. And it's just not that way, even though those same standards are applied to the rest of the population, it's just not the, not the way it's not feasible. <laughs> Yeah, no, you said a couple of things that um, really get me um, worked out. Very interesting. Um, narcissism, first of all, um, let me just say in a general way, there's plenty of evidence um, historically and culturally to suggest that there is a strong connection between these kinds of narcissistic disorders and, um, and rising inequality, because people understand that as the competition gets more intense and as it gets less fair, um, they need to um, build up these identities and then protect them. Uh, and so you get this kind of narcissism in this, in this context. Uh, then the other thing that you mentioned, which is really critical to understand, is um, social mobility. So the, the backstory about the United States is that this is the land of the free and you can make it if you try. And um, you know, we're, 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 we're super mobile, is the, is the story. The facts uh, are completely different from that. It turns out that our, our social mobility is substantially lower than that of, uh, of many other countries, other, other countries that historically have had um, those social mobility. So we're lower than most of the European countries, certainly lower than, than Germany and the, um, the Scandinavian countries. We're lower than Japan. Uh, we're lower than Canada. Um, and a, a significant aspect of that is it turns out that the, the least mobile people of all are the people in the top 10% and then in the bottom uh, 10%. And as far as the top 10% goes, it's pretty straightforward how that's happened. Uh, we've got a wonderful selective university system that um, you know produces fantastic educations, but it is um, and it 
makes an effort to include some representatives from, from the bottom, but uh, overwhelmingly it's serving that, that top decile. Um, in addition, there are other um, advantages that these families on top can offer their offspring, the connections, the, uh, the residential locations, um, you know, the color of their skin to some extent, um, and, and all these things lead to a, um, a, a pretty low, relatively low degree of, of mobility compared to, to other countries. And unfortunately, it turns out that, again, as inequality rises, this effect becomes stronger. The, the richer groups are effectively even better able to protect their status and entrench themselves. So that's a, a big story about what's happening now. You mentioned the university system. I'm wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. I mean, we, we, we did the, we covered, I guess, the first half of it, which is the curating of the child's experience to lead them to the, the eventual pinnacle of the college experience, uh, which better be a, 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 an amazing one, because that reflects on me as the parent. Um, and that's, I, that's also, I think, an identifiable trait if we're looking at this group sociologically. Yeah, so education is really critical to this whole story. I mean, it's part of the, the narrative of, uh, of the group as a whole. I mean, there are many narratives. The most important one is that uh, we're special because we're educated, that education gives us merit, distinguishes us, and it explains why we earn so much money. Um, the facts don't really support that. But uh, more than that, more importantly, um, they also distract from a, a more real and less fortunate narrative about the United States education over the last uh, century. So uh, one of the big accomplishments of the US uh, in, I think, in the starting in the mid 19th century was to create a public university system. Um, and I think by the middle of the 20th century or the, let's say the last, uh, the third quarter of the 20th century, it was um, uh, successful in a limited way. It was, it was you know, obviously uh, discriminatory in many ways, but it nonetheless, um, provided a, a public higher education to a large group of people and um, uh, increased social mobility. What's happened in the last 30 or 40 years is a significant reversal. We still have public universities, except they're not really public. Uh, they're mostly paid for, or at least more than half is paid for now by students. Um, and then uh, even worse, the, we've kind of created a privatized uh, 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 segment within the public universities, uh, sort of super elite sections that behave like private universities. And then we have a private uh, selective university system on the side. So the, the net result is that instead of having a, a public higher education system um, that we were developing for a while, and as a number of other countries have, we have a, an effectively privatized system that um, works very well for a, a small number of people that make it to the top, works, works reasonably well for wealthy people who are able to push their kids through, uh, um, and then saddles significant numbers of you know, the broad mass of of Americans who pursue higher education with um, excessive debt and um, inadequate uh, career prospects. So uh, the education system from being a kind of engine of mobility has turned into an engine of class uh, reproduction. And just as a, a final point on this is why the, it, I think it's interesting to focus on the 9.9%. When you talk about it to people within this group who are aspiring to it, they tend to think that the university issue is purely about admissions to these super selective universities. You know, you know who gets into Harvard and, 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 and so on. And that's, that's an example of an incredibly inward focused, narrow um, perspective on the problem. Those selective universities represent a very small part of our university system. They're really relevant only for what they, how they uh, explain the ways in which the rest of the thing is kind of screwed up. So, um, and it's that kind of blindness, that idea that, well, we can solve all the problems by tweaking the admissions policies of the Ivy League or something like that is, um, I think, part of, the, part of the problem that we face. I mean, it's it's like pretty much most of college uh, that applies to like this specific the the selectiveness that also codifies like the, the same class standards for the 9.9 percent i mean it's as you say it's systemic it's not just the ivy league and like that's why i get you know there's i i'm i'm so cynical sometimes but i see like feel good stories about you know this kid came from nothing and went to this school and like the entire that exact class of people cheers on that kind of individual story um and makes a movie out of it and options it immediately it's just like that's just built to reinforce the fact that you think that the way that you're participating in society is somewhat earned and special <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I mean, it, that, you're so right. And those stories, honestly, they are inspiring. I, I shed a tear over them too. I mean, they're, they're good. I mean, they're, in, in themselves, it's wonderful. If you, you know, you see, um, you know, a young person with no um, advantages, their, their father was an unemployed taxi driver or whatever, and they, they, they make it through and they get the scholarships. I think that's fantastic. Um, and I wouldn't want to um, disparage those, but you're right. They, those, those narratives, they're, they're the Horatio Alger, you know, rags to riches things that ultimately are used to, to validate um, an, a, an unjust um, system. I mean, it's, um, that's why it's important to step back and look at the bigger numbers and see how many Horatios there are out there and, and how many people are basically, uh, are, are not gonna make it that way. You, you touched on the racial element a little bit earlier, but just how um, it, it's not shocking that there are extreme racial divisions in this 9.9% group and that it's mostly white. Um, tell us a little bit about your research in that area and, and what you were what you found. Yeah, so there, there are many um, overlapping issues here. Um, first, in terms of the numbers, um, it's hard to get really um, super solid numbers on it, but the best I can figure out is that African Americans represent about 1.7% um, of the uh, top of the 9.9%, uh, whereas you know they account for about 13%, 13 to 14% of the general population. Um, Latinos are um, about the same, 1.9%, um, and account for a slightly larger percentage of the population. So huge, huge disproportion. The 9.9% is basically 90% white, the general population, or the 90%, let's say, below, or actually about 65% white. Um, so that's, you know, first fundamental fact. Um, and um, you just have to accept that that is what is really happening in our society. There are many explanations for it. Um, no, no doubt discrimination is uh, still a big part of the story. Uh, historical discrimination is also very clearly a big part of the story because um, uh, real estate is a real factor in separating the 9.9% from the 90%. And um, uh, what the real estate numbers show is first that um, uh, white people tend to own homes much more than black people. And, um, and uh, studies also show that essentially equivalent homes are um, equivalent homes uh, between white and black neighborhoods are worth, according to one study, $48,000 less in neighborhoods that are identified as majority black. Um, and there's even some further studies that suggest that individual homes maybe um, uh, have lower value uh, if the owner happens to be black. So uh, those are, uh, real estate's a big part of the story and that's obviously a kind of um, you know reflection of discrimination in the past and discrimination in the, in the present. Um, but there's a lot of complexity to this story. And um, the one that, that strikes me and I wanted to draw attention to is very, hopefully very hard to cover it in a podcast. So I appreciate you allowing me to go on and on. Um, it's, um, it's that often what is more interesting uh, or should be more concerning is the way in which we frame the race questions. Um, and there's a tendency within the people who are in the 9.9% or buy into the culture of the 9.9% to frame re uh, race questions in a way that excludes economic issues, that basically treats race as a kind of um, isolated category that you can, uh, and racial discrimination is something that you can solve and fix for. It's something that happens in individuals' heads um, and uh, you can examine it and treat it independent of um, economic class and also independent of, of politics and of the politics that follow from economic conflict. And I think that that's, that's profoundly misguided uh, and it leads to a, um, you know, a misunderstanding of um, and, and, and false solutions to, to race problems in the United States. It's a really, um, it's a complicated story to get out. I wish I could sum it up a little bit better, but, um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on it? No, I mean, I, I think I, I wanted to. Well, one, I think what you said is, is true. And the fact the home ownership piece and the neighborhood piece and like we don't talk enough about redlining in this country um, and also the what suburbia has done to codify like this very 
I've said codify maybe seven times today. Now I'm realizing it. I'll try not to, but um, but to 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 cement like this exact uh class of people that you're talking about. So I'm wondering if you could expand on that a little bit more because that's obviously an economic problem as well as a racial problem together, and they're inextricable. Yeah, so I mean, there, there's interesting work on this. Um, there's been some, you know, great investigations of of redlining in the um, in the past. And there's a book and an author whose name is escaping me right now, but it's sort of a central um, text in this. Definitely um, uh, has a lot of um, useful information in, in in explaining how the redlining in the past sort of carried on um, into the present um, and has consequences. Uh, but then there's this other um, uh, interesting kind of analysis that shows how the dynamic works um, now. And it's basically, it runs through tipping point ideas. So um, you have um, neighborhoods that are, that let's say used to be all, all white. Um, and then um, they start to uh, become a little more uh, diversified. They, um, uh, and that, tends to be fine in terms of real estate values up to a point. Uh, and then when that point is reached, and the point depends on the, the, um, the region because regions behave differently, um, neighborhood can slide all the way to the other side and then suddenly all the values go down um, uh, you know, once it becomes less than um, a certain percentage um, white. So, um, and as you can imagine, if that process plays out, in some large number of neighborhoods across the country, what that effectively means is that non-white people who are buying into neighborhoods have a much greater risk of facing a significant um, downturn. Whereas the um, people, mostly white people, but not all, because some some number of non-white people will be able to buy into the white neighborhoods, um, will uh, tend to see an appreciation in, in their values, and so they will, you know, succeed in in, in joining the um, the desirable class. Yeah. And, and the, the concept of risk is something that is, I think, a theme in, in your book. And correct me if I'm wrong, but just the idea that risk is very much minimized for this top 9.9% .9 class. But for the rest of the people striving to participate in the class, that class, which is, again, very difficult to achieve, if not impossible for a great majority of the uh, the 90%, that that the the risk that is taken on to participate is much greater and can lead to disastrous consequences. Yeah, and um, here's here's really an interesting way of getting at that. You know, it's very hard to um, talk about risk in a, in a you know quantitatively rigorous way, but you can what you can quantify. I think what we're all familiar with is that there are various interesting health disparities, very alarming health disparities. Um, in the United States, and they they map um, unfortunately pretty well into economic class. Now it it turns out that um, health issues um, are to simplify a lot. The single biggest link or explanatory value for health um, issues is, is stress, and stress is is essentially a measure of risk. So what we've got is um, an economy and a system that um, maybe distributing income at levels that is above the poverty line for most people, but it's distributing risk and consequently stress um, in a, an even more uneven way than it is the incomes. And that then leads us to a, a misunderstanding. We think, oh, well, the, you know, the average income in this area is above the poverty line, so therefore everybody must be happy, right? But, but it turns out that they're not. And the, the, the aggregate way to tell is, to, is basically to look at and, and see that there's a tremendous amount of stress producing a tremendous amount of, of, um, of ill health. And then, of course, if you look at it in a more granular way, you can see it. You can see that basically you, the, the, a lot of the, uh, the um, workers in our economy with the lowest incomes are also the ones who have the least control over their schedule, who have the, the least certainty about the tenure of their position. Um, you know, they can be fired at a moment's notice. They can be told they're going to have to work a different shift all of a sudden. Um, they have the least health insurance, um, you know, the least support. Um, and so they, even, even if their income manages to kind of make it to a certain average over an extended period of time, they're facing a lot of risk um, 
And then what happens on the other side with the 9.9% is the 9.9% have figured out how to pad their lives and live within you know, nice cushy rooms where no one's ever gonna get hurt because you just bounce off the walls. Uh, um, I guess that brings up this, up this other thing that's important about both, not just the risk, but invisibility, right? The people, basically the people in, who tend to make it just don't get what life is like outside of their, their padded rooms. Yeah, I mean, I'm reminded there was a Jacobin piece uh, from a few weeks ago about stress being a collective issue, not just an individual one, and how, like, basically corporate stress management techniques are so isolated from like, the reality of what majority, what caused distress for majority of people. It's like, treat this on, like, an individual basis as opposed to an understanding that this is a part of, like, this exact unequal system that you mentioned, um, which brings me a little bit to where I want to go, which is to apply a bit more to the present day, 2020. Uh, well, not that your book didn't, but just to talk a little bit more about what you said in the context of the pandemic and also the resurgence of labor that we're seeing a little bit uh, happening right now and this larger consciousness that's happening with labor. Um, what did you find in studying this aristocracy and then also the the comparatively to the rest of society um in response to the pandemic and how did that maybe sh shape your thinking about some of this so the pandemic uh, is really interesting in this context because um on the one hand it has increased inequality on paper um substantially but on the other hand it has um shaken um consciousness in some way. And for me, that's just like at an abstract level, that's really interesting because my main argument goes a little bit in the opposite direction. I've, I've been essentially saying that for the most part, the consciousness tends to follow the inequality. And here we've got a, a situation that, um, that seems to work in the, in the reverse. Um, of course, I think it's working in the reverse because even though inequality has increased um, on paper, in a, you know, sort of financial sense during the pandemic, um, the shifts that we're seeing may have this certain positive side in that they portend, hopefully, a, potentially a somewhat more egalitarian um, outcome in the long term. And I'll, I'll mention a couple of things that I thought were particularly interesting. Like, I think the, the wave of, of, of strike action that um, was happening in the United States um, Earlier in the fall, I think that the you know the great the so-called great resignation. Um, I think these are you know fundamentally positive developments. The, the uh, you know, one of the biggest stories of the last fifty years is this you know, decoupling of uh, labor productivity from labor wage increases, and it's basically the result of a disempowerment of labor. And um, anything that brings a little power back there makes the equation a little more fair uh, between labor and capital, I think it's going to be a, a good thing. And I think the pandemic, you know, could, could contribute to that. As far as its impact on the um, professional and managerial types who are the backbone of the 9.9%, um, you know, as you, as you know, um, it was pretty easy for most 9.9% in, in relative terms, at least of, of a certain age and above, to um, to adapt to a life um, at home and on screen, uh, it's quite a bit easier than doing frontline work. Um, uh, but I think it also did come with some, you know, increased awareness, you know, an increased awareness of our interdependence. Um, you know, it, the way we talk about health now, I think, is dramatically different. I didn't see the piece that you're referring to, but um, the understanding that health is essentially something we pursue collectively. You know, and health issues like stress or issues that we have to solve in some sense, in some sense collectively. I think before the pandemic, you could argue that in a theoretical way, and not many people would would buy it. I think now you can argue it in a pretty visceral way. I think we all we all at some level now get that you know everybody's behavior in some way contributes to and can solve help solve um, the pandemic um, issue. You mentioned the the term professional managerial types, which you know we often use uh, on this program and in just political discourse, uh, because 
I, it, it made me think of a question I'd forgotten to ask earlier because I wanted to see if you could touch on how this 9.9% um, reveals itself or how it breaks down along regional lines. Because, I mean, in my in my mind, of course, I'm envisioning suburbs of major metropolitan areas, but um, is that an accurate vision or is it, is it more dispersed throughout the country than I'm, I'm realizing? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let me ask you first, when you speak about the professional managerial elites, are you speaking about them in a, in a harsh tone of voice or in a, in a, in a friendly and welcoming one? Uh, definitely not in a friendly and welcoming one. Okay. All right. Um, so look, the, you know, the 9.9%, if you understand it as a, a wealth distribution or an income distribution, um, it's got a lot of people who, it's dominated by professional and managerial types. Um, uh, but it doesn't consist entirely of them. And there's going to be a lot of small business owners, I mean, a lot of retirees um, and other people like that um, who we scattered around the country. Um, but that's, you know, figuring out the um, components of a particular part of the wealth distribution isn't as interesting as figuring out how this accumulation of wealth in certain places is shaping our culture. And it's in that respect that, the, the political and managerial elites have a very special and distinctive role to play. Um, and here, I think the really interesting and unfortunate story is that while there is a role, I think, in any modern society for something that you can call professionalism or something that you can call managerialism, um, I think that those roles break down. Um, they become dysfunctional, they become parasitic. Uh, under the conditions of rising equality. Because what happens is that the professions, instead of you know, uh, realizing whatever professional values they're trying to um, realize, which I think are often necessary given the imperfection of markets and the, the need for um, you know, communities to sort of um, trust people. Um, the, it, in the case of a rising inequality, what tends to happen is that those professions will become uh, increasingly self-serving. And they'll, they'll figure out how to protect themselves at everybody else's expense. So in the United States, a classic example of that, I'm afraid to say, is um, physicians. I mean, yes, we are all supposed to love our doctors and then usually individually they're okay, but um, they've managed to set up a kind of guild that uh, keeps the number of physicians down. So actually fewer physicians in the United States than there are in many other countries. And that's one of the reasons why they get paid twice as much here as they do in other countries. And even so, our health outcomes are not um, as good as they are in other countries. So that's that's just one example. There are many other examples. So I don't want to pick on just them. Uh, and then the same thing happens with the managerial elite. And there, it's it's just so kind of obvious that you just have to scratch your head and wonder, you know, how, why why we even why we even need to talk about this. I mean, we all know that the compensation um, patterns in, in senior management. I mean, it's preposterous. The, um, the, um, the, the uh, drug company CEOs, I believe last year took home, actually last year's not a good example because they took home even more given all the unusual stuff. In previous years, they were taking home about a billion dollars a year. That's 20 individuals or, or 60 individuals taking home a billion dollars a year, which was more than the CDC was spending on um, significant parts of uh, preparing for a pandemic and so on. I mean, it's just preposterous when you go back in time, or even when you look at other countries, you find that, that there's no justification for this kind of um, egregious, uh, excessive compensation. It's all clearly the result of a, of a captured um, market and a kind of basically corrupt system. Um, and so the question is, why does it persist? Why, why and why can't we just, you know, talk about it in a sort of in a, in, a, in a plain way. And I think that part of it is because the ideology of the 9.9% keeps on telling us that, no, 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 if you if you succeed, if you make money, it's because you're really just, just incredibly good. I mean, um, you know, Bill Gates, for example, uh, he, he made all that money, but it must mean that he's a really good programmer. He must be about a million times better than any other programmer or your coder you've ever seen, right? Um, and it's just, it, it's crazy, but the, we know the that you know ideology of um, of, uh, of merit and, and the market myth um, sustains that professional and, and managerial elite and makes them allows them to become parasitic in this in this context of rising inequality. 
Well, Matthew Stewart, uh, the book is called The 9.9%, The New Aristocracy That Is Entrenching Inequality and Warping Our Culture. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for your time today uh, and the discussion. Really appreciate it. Great. Well, very glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break, come back, wrap things up. We are back. We are back. Um, we touched a little bit on the, the labor consciousness um, during that interview, but I wanted to highlight this. More Perfect Union, uh, an organization that you should definitely be following on social media because they've been putting out great pieces specifically on uh, the the union resurgence in the country they've been following these uh labor movements on the ground including the starbucks unionization effort they spoke with a former starbucks manager named Brittany harrison and she revealed to them that she was fired after uh, i guess uh helping expose starbucks's union busting Brittany has cancer she was also forced to work as she was feeling incredibly sick from cancer, and she tells her story here. So October 14th, we had this meeting that was supposed to be about the fall launch, but it wasn't. And I was like, yeah, I need to record this meeting because I'm gonna have to pull off and support my team. I'm gonna need to refer back to this. I don't wanna miss anything because this is such an important launch. And so I started recording. I did not realize what I was going to record. We're a huge company. You didn't love to get a hold of us. You know how much money they would make off of us? It, the meeting started with my district manager saying, let's talk about what's going on in Buffalo. It kind of all unraveled from there, and they started talking about the union, why the union is bad, why the union doesn't align with Starbucks missions and values, why partners who want to be part of the union aren't true partners to Starbucks. The union was painted in a very negative light, which made me uncomfortable because I have family that's in union. And so I'm sitting there while she's talking about how unions are like the Catholic church because you have to talk to a priest if you want to talk to God, just like in unions, you have to talk to a union representative if you want to talk to anyone. None of this makes sense. None of these things are appropriate to say. And you're saying how all of these partners want more than what they deserve. I was asking to have fewer days. I was asking for what my other options were. I was told I could go on a leave of absence, but those are unpaid. And also you would have to pay your benefits out of your own pocket. And also you couldn't get a second job because then Starbucks wouldn't be required to give you benefits, which obviously wouldn't work for me because I can't be unpaid and paying bills, right? I remember calling my district manager in tears. I was like, I don't have family. I don't have friends. I have no one. What am I supposed to do? All right, uh, let's pause there.
if you want to see the full video, you should go over to More Perfect Union. Um, but obviously, it's incredibly disturbing. And like, I just keep hearing echoing in my brain, even from Howard Schultz's presidential run, but before that as well. Um, Starbucks, most progressive corporation in America, Starbucks treating its employees correctly, able to um, be a multinational corporation in this day and age of of uh, corporate malfeasance and actually is providing um, for for its its employees. And obviously, obviously, it's not the case. Like they, 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 they can do all these racial trainings they can allow in New York City anybody to use your bathrooms even if you're not a customer and you can't buy anything but when it comes to like i mean they literally touted that and that is a good thing for houseless people in the city i understand that but but that is another thing like they're part of that problem that denver built the public bathrooms in the first place and they get business from that yes exactly exactly and so for the most part that is really just the the issue is is that we don't have any public spaces in this country and so like they can respond and do you know like I, I, I pull I just pulled up an article from the HR Digest. Starbucks once again sets precedent as the most progressive company in the world, and it's because of just from a pers- from a public relations perspective, they're happy to have that branding. But when it cuts into their bottom line, oh boy, and that's what you're gonna see with like firing uh, or, or and retaliating against a woman who has cancer because she exposed that effort and you see how these things compound too like the way she said i i i was offended by what they're saying about people in unions because i have family in unions unfortunately that isn't that's not an experience i have like i don't know i'm from north dakota like i don't know anybody in the closest i knew to somebody in a union was the guy on my block who worked for the railroad um but you people when when and that's why like these victories can even though we're so far behind, like I think 1.2% of food and drink workers mm-hmm. like this are in a union. But if you can start to build that, so all of a sudden people know somebody who's in this scary union that, again, like people are saying is between you and God somehow, as if you, as if you're, <laughs> as if you have unfiltered access to a God through your boss somehow, um, when you don't have a union, like it's just ridiculous. But yeah, I think that was, I mean, it's, it's thing, and always film your boss when they're doing stuff like this too. That's yeah. another good thing is film them like they're cops. I'm I'm trying to I'm looking at some of the uh, international statistics on unions just to to make that um, yeah I got it, Bradley don't worry um, just to to hammer that that home uh, in Iceland over ninety percent of uh, total employees are in labor unions Canada it's twenty six point five percent which is low. Uh, Compared to a lot of other European countries, UK, 24.7%. The United States is down at 10.6%. And that's the result of a many years long effort in that area. Um, And when you see these changes, as Matt said, it can have generational effects. Because if you know somebody who's in the union and you have that literacy... And there's that skeleton there for you um you're more likely to understand your rights and push for unionization in your workplace and if the internet offers any opportunity it should be if as far as democratized communication go it should be these narratives of the workers rising up against their bosses that's uh, i think a good aspiration for us all all right folks we are going to head into the fun half now but first matt how was left reckoning last night uh, Left Reckoning was great. We had Tom Anisha John on to talk about Barbados going republic. Is it uh, as significant as it sounds? Um, in some ways, it's great, of course. In other ways, there's a lot of work to be done. We talked about Mia Motley uh, as a leader. You know, she's a very good um, uh, sort of on the foreign um, in for international relations realm. Is she, is she quite as good domestically or maybe not? Um, uh, Tom Anisha has an amazing amount of uh, wisdom and in these topics so uh, i 
would encourage everyone to check that out. Patreon.com just left reckoning. We got into Innes Cantor and, oh. uh, and uh, his uh, uh, <laughs> not willing to uh, talk about uh, the China stuff uh, on the court with LeBron, apparently. Um, and uh, so, yeah, if you want to get access to David and I's take on Innes Cantor's what do you mean um, on the court from the bench? Exactly. Well, there was two. There was two clips. There was him on the bench not saying anything. As I forget who at the other Celtics player was talking with LeBron, and uh, and then there was another one where Ennis uh, really avoided LeBron on the court. So um, yeah, we talked about that. I gave my um, talk about why it's annoying to if we're going to discuss the possibility of um, you know ethnic genocide or cultural genocide in uh, China. Um, which uh, I'm I'm open to hearing information about that um, because I think that's a you know, pattern that great powers do. Why does it always seem to come from people that want to um, deny those genocides here yeah. and indeed like um, deny teaching of those um, things? Do you think yeah. Lauren Boebert voted yes on that uh, that sanctioning of of China Chinese right. products in the house as she accuses I Ilhan mean, Omar of? of I mean, I'm all for expansive definitions of um, genocide because I think we need to come to grips with how uh, regularly nations do those things, um, but not with fucking Marco Rubio. But anyway, uh, we talked about the Ines Cantor thing. Patreon.com says left reckoning to hear a take there. Ines Cantor freedom. Please do not. I'm not going to use. I'm not going to use his. I'm not going to say that. No. Um, Matt and Brandon, how are you guys? Hey, doing good. How are you? Hey, I'm doing fine. Doing well. Have you're in the festive spirit? Look at that. Yeah, yeah like I mean, stocking behind you, Brandon. Very cool. The war. Yeah, the war on Christmas has been reignited. So you know, reignited. Reignited. There's a flame. There's a. I mean, yeah. are you, are oh, you dropping, huh. that's funny. Yeah. Good are joke. you dropping uh, Easter eggs about your your involvement or lack of involvement potentially? I mean, I'm not saying, but I'm just saying. Well, I mean, I think the the proof behind him shows where his allegiance lies on this war on Christmas. So I don't think that was him at all. Nah, Could be uh, overcompensating. The war on Christmas, I think, is always raging in my heart. So you know, I'm glad that it's now raging in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> Binder, what's good. happening uh, over on Doomed? And I'm incredibly excited about something new that you might be launching soon. I, every time I see you tweet about crypto, I'm like, whoop. Yeah, I got, I, I, I heard that uh, it's been mentioned on this very show since I've I've made that announcement slash hint about my my new show, which uh, I'm not gonna, still not gonna, no 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 the nothing concrete in terms of. Uh, launch yet but it will be in the coming weeks on Did I uh anything just there that i shouldn't have no no that was all fine nothing more that i i said than uh last I week if that was in public or in private that's like no, no, no i think most people know now that uh i'm, I'm gonna do something they just don't know what <laughs> what it's called and when yet gotcha. um so yeah it's coming so stay tuned but tonight at youtube.com slash matt binder uh i will have uh, the Gilded Age uh, podcast on, that's Walker Bragman and Alex Koch. And we will be talking about the, uh, you know, uh, quote unquote lefties. And I use that term very loosely, but there's a bunch of people on the left who've been uh, really dabbling and maybe dabbling is being too kind to them, but dabbling in uh, anti-vaxxer, uh, COVID denialism. And it's, it's not good that people are spreading this sort of stuff, especially people who supposedly uh, care uh, and have leftist ideologies. Uh, and we'll be talking about, talking about that tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern time, youtube.com slash Matt Binder. And, uh, and Brandon, anything happen over on the discourse that you want to follow? I do, absolutely. Tonight, I'm going to be re-uploading one of our archived episodes that was taken down a few months ago uh, from, you know, our SoundCloud feed regarding the Russiagate conspiracy that we uh, we talked about when it first dropped. So this is a, a old, sort of an old archived episode, but it's three hours long, uh, never released in full before. So you'll all be, you know, lucky to see how right I've been all along. Oh, wow. So yeah, you, you must be thinking that it aged well. I mean, I can't remember what's in it, but yeah. Uh. <laughs> All right, folks, we are going to head into the fun half. We will be taking your calls, 646-257-3920, reading your IMs. See you then there. Left is best. 
Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous? You're a little bit uh, upset? You're riled up? Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jabber. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. Wow. But Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We're back. Really? We are. We yeah. are back. Yes. Oh, we are. Oh, back. We are back. Oh, hello. I, hello. I actually, hello, everyone. I actually gave up my greatest weakness that I'm very easy to ignore. I'm not, not ignore, annoy, but also ignore too. I'm very <sighs> easy to annoy. You 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 mixed up like your uh, insecurity with your uh, biggest uh, like that you feel that you're easy to ignore but also easy to annoy. Actually, you know, I'm kind of like a big black guy with a kind of nasally voice. So I'm very hard to ignore. Uh, but but uh, annoy, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that's like kind of a prerequisite for being on the show. <laughs> that's not to say that I'm clumsy, though. I, I do move with the grace of a cat when I'm trying to be silent in that way. What annoys you? Huh? What What's the last thing that really annoyed you? What's the last thing that really annoyed or, me? Or anything that, that shouldn't have annoyed you but did annoy you? Oh, my gosh. Well, <laughs> the movie A Needle in a Time Stack really annoyed me. Uh, <laughs> No, no, no. Um, the last thing that really annoyed me, but should not. I get like, I don't know, really overwhelmingly annoyed by like people who necessarily like when you're walking on the sidewalk, like, you know, they insist on having to walk in a line of three down the sidewalk that only allows three people yes. to move in any both directions. And they just, you like, they look at you when you're like trying to get past like, what are we supposed to do? Exactly. <laughs> like, I don't know, like walk like a normal person, like an adult. There's that, and then you know, I you gotta give leeway for the older folks to do this. But when people veer like left and right and don't walk in a straight path, and like oh, I'm yeah. a fast walker, I'm like gonna try to move, pass you on the left. Okay, you're veering to the left now. Okay, I'm gonna try to get around there. I always feel like a, 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 a I feel like a, I don't know what I feel like, but it doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> That's a pet peeve. Of yours. It makes you hate old people. You can say it, Matt. It's not my opinion. It's Matt yeah. Lex, Lex, but you know, I don't mind feel- voicing it for him. Yeah, that's, I guess it does, it makes me, it makes me hate my elders, and that's why I'm not comfortable with it. 
you also hate cars, so I mean that's. Oh yeah, but thing. I'm I'm open about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean I don't know. There's a lot of things that annoy me. It's a little bit hard yard signs, specific oh, yeah, yeah. specific yard signs. Don't reignite that old controversy. I, I can't. I mean, I, I, maybe I just did by accident. Um, some IMs, maybe a little bit about the first hour of the show. Uh, science for people. Signs people for HR3, boycott Kellogg, buy Magic Spoon. Yes. Jack from Albany. Well, to- careful. I don't know if they're... I, I, I have to check, actually. I don't... You have to be careful if people on strike are actually calling for a boycott or if not, because, I mean, I guess they probably are, but... You- I think the Kellogg... I could be wrong, but I think they are in Kel- in the Kellogg situation. Okay, cool. That's but right. I, actually, I mean, I don't know why I'm speaking definitively on that. That's just, like, my vague it, recollection. It's always good to double-check. I mean, I, this only comes up because in, in video games, it's often like, okay, well, they're they're abusing the laborers and they want to be represented, It's but they're not saying don't buy this video game when it comes out because that'll, like, hurt the entire development staff. I mean, different cases and different industries but always be sure to check right um chicken shit see there emma i don't think you have the right to comment on boris johnson since as a woman you don't have a life force to be drained that's a good point but i do provide life force um uh, there were there was like women who had their life force vessel sorry go on I feel like that's incorrect. I feel like in the movie Life Force, which takes place in the UK, women did have their life force drained by the male aliens in that one. Well, well mostly men. That does seem force. like a documentary, but we're they are commenting on Tucker Carlson saying that COVID feminizes you because it drains the life force out of you. So those are the mental gymnastics we're working with. I think that if you watched Life Force, you could make a good case that Life Force is about that as well, specifically that. Hmm. Just to clarify, uh, Kellogg's, there, are, there is a boycott on. So. There is. Good. Um, I'm glad I wasn't talking out of my ass. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, but I just... I, yeah. Um, but big butt... All right, come on, Jesus. Notice the conflation <laughs> Tucker Car- Fucker Carlson draws uh, between feminizing and taking the life force. See that line draw there? Takes the life force out of force out of some people and feminizes them. It's the misogyny. Yeah, I, yeah, we we talked about that a little bit. Maybe after you, I am. Um, Pine Co. Just want to know if Matt Brandon or anyone on the MR crew had any thoughts on YouTube removing the ability to see dislikes. I think I wasn't it's, aware that happened. I saw that. I think it's kind yeah. of. Wait, what were you saying, Emma? I saw that. I think it's kind of silly. I mean, I, it, this was like Insta- when Instagram for the mental health of children temporarily, you couldn't see likes. I, I, who cares? I don't know. It's like the the tweaking of these these systems does nothing. Yeah, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal that it was made out to be when YouTube did this. I know there's people who are very upset. But I mean, I, I see the pluses and, and minuses. People have argued that, you know, it's it sucks because... If something is an actual like bad video, like apparently there's a bunch of like bullshit like tutorial videos out there that just try to like make money from YouTube ads, so they're not very good. Yeah, um, that, that, that's and- a good point. Like, I, I you would want to know if this reviewer or like if this person trying to help you troubleshoot something, if, if it's like 900 dislikes to like 10 likes, that would actually be very useful to know. Right, and for a video like that. But at the same time, and the reason YouTube says they did the move was because it, uh, you know, uh, dislike mobs were ruining the YouTube experience for some people in terms of like, you know, someone creates a video about, I don't know, a, a feminist critique of uh, a, a movie that came out or whatever. And of course, you get uh, thousands of angry people going after them for sharing their opinion and just like bombing their video with dislikes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I see the, the, the pluses and minuses of both. I don't really think it matters either way in big picture, but, uh, I don't know. Don't really have a, an opinion, whether it's good or bad. I, I see both points of view, to be honest. Yeah. And to me, you can imply the same criticism about like the same plus and the inverse of the pluses and the minuses of this move is just like having dislikes. I mean, I don't think it, it, it kind of presents its new new problems like in the same context and that's what's a little odd to me you know what they could have done they could have uh made it a requirement for your disliked account you had to watch at least like 
60 mm. seconds of the video or something like that, mm -hmm. then that I think would have given you the best of both worlds. Mm. I don't know. To me, it feels like when, like, whenever Twitter decides to remove all of the edges from its platform by, like, making the avatar space, like, a circle instead of a square, or by making the font, like, slightly more rounded to, like, relieve aggression, it's just, like, a really childish way of slapping a Band-Aid on, like, the larger issue that has been created on that platform basically by the algorithm that also made it prominent. Like, you know, I would imagine that a lot of these sort of like, I guess, hate raids or whatever you're calling or like dislike bombs are the same that they are on any other site where people who are fans of a particular content creator decide to like, I don't know, uh, mass dislike or mass report something. And so it just gets like mass dislike to report away. But that, you know, that kind of environment has been created by like YouTube through its, you know, incentive program on like ads and through like promoting certain video channels after another. And so like, this just seems like a way to be said to be doing something about the toxicity that it yeah. otherwise relies on. Right. Yeah. I think I think what makes YouTube a little bit different, though, you're, you're right for the most part. But I think the thing that makes YouTube a little bit different is I can't think of another social network where you can like log your dislike for something to someone with an identity. If you know what I'm saying, like Reddit has downvotes, but you don't really identify on like no one's going after a specific username. Like you don't what defines you on Reddit isn't your profile and what lives on your profile page. But like on, on Twitter and Facebook and things where your profile is more prominent, I don't think there's any way to like derank or like, you know, make a negative mark on a piece of like your content. So that's probably where YouTube differs a little bit. Oh, no, I definitely agree. I just think that, you know, at this point, like it's been, it was part, and I don't care if they remove the dislike button or not. It just seems like a, you know, a solution to the problem that is largely being created by the monetization incentives of YouTube. And so like the whole people can downvote you or it's just like a symptom of the at larger economy that's been created on that platform. And, you know, it's just meant to obscure the stuff is happening. Versus yeah, they're like actually, versus actually solving the larger problem because the larger problem makes the money and the downvotes don't. Yeah, they want right. putting a salve on uh, a symptom that they are the disease that's causing. Them. Yeah. Yes. No, it's like yeah, you you like run over someone with your car and then hand them a band aid. Right. Uh, well, at least at least you stopped. That was very nice. <laughs> Stalemate. I'm a parent of a kid uh, in one of the Kansas City school districts, and we are currently being targeted by Missouri AG Eric Schmidt, asking parents to send in pictures of what he considers to be an illegal act, it's not, of our local school district continuing to require masks in school as cases skyrocket. In very creepy fashion, he set up an email address, illegalmandates at ago.mo.gov and he's blasting this on his twitter handle among all other pl uh, among other places there are a lot of vulnerable people in our family that need protection and it feels like schmidt who is running against the mccloskey goon for our gerrymandered senate opening doesn't mind violating my kids privacy or safety to climb the ladder of the political moment I don't know who's back in office checking that email address for what could be pictures of my kid without my consent, but wouldn't it be just a shame if a bunch of people spam that email address for unintended purposes? A damn shame indeed. That is true. Let me repeat that email address uh, here. Illegal mandates at AGO, standing for AG offices, I believe, dot MO, Missouri, dot gov. Illegal mandates at ago.mo.gov. All right, you want to get into some clips, or Brandon, do you need to be right back? All right. Uh, okay. Uh, oh boy, I just saw. I, I just saw this by the. I just saw this by the way. I got my my Politico playbook email, but this is this is disturbing. Um, uh, Data for Progress I did a poll. It's still early, obviously. But found that uh, in Pennsylvania, John Fetterman is only leading by two points in a head-to-head -head general election matchup uh, between him and Dr. I Oz. Know. I knew you were going to say it. <laughs> oh, my God. What is wrong with people? Come on. This shouldn't be hard. <laughs> Dr. Oz is America, Dr. Oz is America's doctor. When you have a society as alienated from their own health care as we are and with a separate culture, putting a doctor on television is like, you know, that's, that's a very powerful thing to do. It's like he was, you know, he's America's doctor. 
Listen, I get, I get Trump guys got a weird charisma. I would even get if like it was Dr. Phil because he's got that whole good old boy from down south thing going on. But what is Dr. Oz providing them? Nothing. I don't see it. Nothing. Well, it's an anti vax I mean, I, I, he, he's got like a television smoothness to him. He said he hits. He seems, all he seems like a. He has the most cliche. Like if you were to look up like snake oil salesman in the dictionary he yeah. is the perfect encapsulation he's got the look and everything like you know uh, it's just so so bizarre to me where on earth have snake oil salesmen have more success than the united states of america and it, that's true they, yeah <laughs> party. i mean and they love they love celebrities they love like degrees that appeal to authority i mean look at all these like you know ceos and doctors that try to run as republicans and like the and they love the fact that he's talking about medical freedom boom well yeah i mean i think that you know to matt's point although i'm not sure who's worse dr Phil or dr oz you know i think that americans are uniquely you know enculturated for these things to happen in a way that they don't necessarily happen outside of this country where you know with people like donald trump and like other reality stars or celebrities getting so heavily involved in like politics at that level uh and then we've just failed to acknowledge i think half the time that you know it's not as though this is a reasonable or unreasonable thing it's just like this is what american culture looks like you know you're taught to just attach a certain level of intelligence and morality to people who have certain positions you know certain levels of fame and when eventually they try to transition from like just being that guy on television who you recognize from like the oprah channel to like a politician who has a real say in the government people are just ready to accept that because that's just what we support like they come you know our society comes pre-ready to accept like celebrity politicians as you know our new messiahs yeah exactly that is a question for the ages, too, by the way. Who's worse, Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz? Jeez. Probably Dr. Phil, but I think there's another one of them. Who's the um who's the Dr. Drew? Who Dr. might be worse, who might be worse than all three? Like it's a it's like a trifecta of really just like terrible TV they're doctors. And they're all the, they're all Republicans, so which is interesting. But I could I could be wrong, but doesn't Dr. Oz do the whole like get up too with like the doctor's out uniform or outfit? Or am I am I missing the mark here? Like well, to I me, think the that, different Doc, Dr. Phil's always come across as a, like one of those like therapy type guys, which is obviously he's very exploitative or whatever. But Dr. Oz is the one like recommending actual medications. And again, I could be wrong. Don't not that familiar with. They were having him on Fox during the pandemic, giving COVID advice too. Well, yeah, I feel like Dr. Yeah. Oz is an actual doctor still. He's like a heart surgeon or something. And like his, he kind of did more, you know, maybe I don't remember him prescribed medication, but he got more into like the, you know, lifestyle and health advice, like, you know, running or taking like garlic pills will help you like ultimately like reduce your rate of certain like heart disease. I don't know if that's actually true or not. Uh, but Dr. Phil, I think is like not really a doctor anymore. Like he lost his right to practice and that's why he called himself Dr. Phil. And so of like doctor whatever his last name is as like an actual legal thing yeah uh, well, so you know i think it's just there is like a level of authority that dr oz might have still that dr you know phil for good reason has you know lost also because he like promotes a lot of like child teen problem teen re-education centers that are bad so you know it's the whole thing about dr oz i just i just looked it up uh he dr phil holds a doctorate in clinical psychology However, he ceased renewing his license to practice psychology in 2006. So the dude's been calling himself a doctor for quite a while without that license. If people want to learn more about this, uh, someone wrote in, Awesome Possum said, Behind the pa Bastard to Two-Part Podcast on Dr. Oz. It's a really good podcast. It's entitled Dr. Oz, Why America's Doctor is a Bastard. So learn more there and we shall move on to the war on Christmas, uh, which uh, is is... I think it, Brandon's background is getting me in the holiday spirit. And by holiday spirit, I mean excited to talk about the burning Fox News uh, Christmas tree. So uh, that was my very, very smooth transition. So the Fox and Friends crew is treating the burning of the Christmas tree outside of the Fox News studios as a uh, basically... A disaster of proportions that they have not seen since, I don't want to name, uh, a national tragedy. Okay, there you go. 9-11, since 9-11. Yeah. That's what they're acting like. Uh, that's what they are acting like. All indications are this was uh, a fire set by 
somebody who might have had some mental problems, somebody who may have been houseless in New York City. They wish so badly that it was uh, a left-wing activist of some sort, but they'll settle for this because like if you're just, you know, what the what the New York Post is calling a vagrant in New York City, you're probably a commie anyway. Um and so this is how the Fox and Friends crew is reacting uh to this incredible tragedy. I spit out my drink when I first watched this clip at the beginning when Steve Ducey says it's beginning to look a lot like arson. I did not know he says that. Normally during the Christmas season, we start the program by showing an outside shot of our all-American Christmas tree on Fox Square. But last night, shortly after midnight, somebody climbed up in the tree and lit it on fire. It's beginning to look a lot like arson. Uh, press right pause for a is second. somebody press who is in custody <laughs> and is being could you imagine like you know the shot he's talking about i mean they're sort of showing it right now uh you know the, the overhead shot of the outside could you imagine if the segment actually just opened up without any explanation and just was the shot of the tree burning? that would have been i would have been, it would been great. It great christmas yeah. is over people <laughs> <laughs> this is what's going on right. They should have left it burning for like the entirety of the night just so people understand. All right, keep going. Climbed up in the tree and lit it on fire. It's beginning to look a lot like arson. <laughs> right now there is somebody who is in custody and is being interviewed by local police. Who sets a Christmas tree on fire? Who sets a Christmas well, tree? Well, I mean, it's fire. just part of the rampage. No city is safe. No person is safe from the subway on down. Here you are at 48th and 6th, right in midtown Manhattan. Uh, it has become a tourist attraction. Every year it gets more and more people. And just one psycho goes up, ignites this thing. Thank goodness we have uh, very excellent security. Within two seconds, he was tackled to the ground. Oh, no. uh, he was subdued. Uh, he says no person is safe. Um actually every person is safe because no one was harmed no christmas trees safe except but probably most christmas trees if we anthropomorphize the christmas tree the all-american sentient christmas tree okay then maybe no person is safe also to answer his question what kind of person lights a christmas tree on fire uh, uncle lewis uh, national lampoon's christmas vacation set the christmas tree on fire and he was a likable fellow that's a good that's an excellent point matt uh, well, well, let's hear if they at least cite him in journalistic integrity as some as a correction of who, uh, uh, for their hypothetical here. More people and just one psycho goes up, ignites this thing. Thank goodness we have uh, very excellent security. Within two seconds, he was tackled to the ground. Uh, he was subdued. And then they find out that he's under arrest right now. Massive investigations through the night. It took place just after midnight last night. Shannon Bream show was covering it uh, from Washington, D.C. So sad. We it have security sad. tape around the tree right now when you walk in. No more music, no more tree. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's it, but it, but it, I think it tells the bigger story. I mean, since we, this is this city but, is so out of control, so out especially of control. in Midtown Manhattan. You, we, yes, the they were city covering, we used to love, right? And but yes, they were covering stories about raids in Pacific Palisades in Beverly Hills, California, and then in 48th and 6th, this is a, a tourist attraction from right. around the globe, and they sit there and they, this one lunatic is able to uh, penetrate in and in a matter of seconds ignite that tree on fire. Thank goodness there's not other structures around it but our whole lobby was full of smoke evidently what? massive investigations massive investigations um yeah let's just play the next clip because this is uh that was from two days ago this is from today they are giving us an update on this massive investigation into the burning alive of the sentient all-american tree it wasn't even a real tree, though. It was like a metal pole. It was like a festivist thing with some, like, you know, uh, what am I looking for? Tinsel. It was a what thing? It was a what thing? It was a festivist thing. It was like a pole How with dare like, some tinsel. You? How I, dare you? I, I dare because I, I had to say, I think this was an inside job. You know, it just seems a little convenient to me that they were just talking about how unsafe all this stuff was. And then suddenly there are trees on fire. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. How perfectly it, it demonstrates the larger point, as Kilmeade says. It is a little bit suspicious. 
I, the one thing that makes me think it wasn't an inside job was because like if it, it they would have probably had someone dress up like an antifa uh protester true, yeah. that made the fact that they are unable to uh sufficiently boogeyman him to like they, they the quotient is not there right to it, it, it doesn't exceed the maximum i guess if, if they found like a, a homeless person to pay to like go do this they would have said like hey can you like take this um uh, i don't know what probably not jacobin they probably do like um like a peacock's um gift card or something like that yeah. I, you, know, you can never you can never uh, rule out incompetence uh on the part of like the people who orchestrated this but you That's know a good say, point but let's see i mean maybe they'll give us some easter eggs in their follow-up yeah, play the update i'm dying to hear the update to this late breaking big important news but i have decided i'm a truther about it <laughs> Oh, they right. seem so he wasn't nice. eligible for the bail under this these new liberal reform laws. That's right. But the judge would, could have found a way to keep him locked up if he felt as though he was a threat to society. Uh, note to judge, he's a threat to society. Well, here's the thing. Uh, in New York, under the new liberal policies of bail reform, arson is only a felony. You can only be held if it's a felony. If the suspect tries to harm a person or commits a hate crime. And apparently lighting a Christmas tree on fire is not a hate crime. Even but though, it is, even you could say. Even though a lot of people yeah. could have been injured? Yeah, here, and, but here's the thing. Who says it's not a hate crime against us, against Fox News? Uh, <laughs> here's the thing. What we do know for sure, and we don't know the guy's motivation. Yeah, but uh, the judge could ask and be under suspicion and keep him locked up. Well, he might have. But here's, the, here's what we do know. According to the New York Post, which is co-owned with us, that Christmas tree was half a million dollars. I know. So this guy tortures a half a million dollars worth of property, property. and he gets to walk? I mean, the problem. First of all, someone got ripped off. That is not a half a million dollar tree. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I'm trying to do the math in my head. Like, damn, that, how is that possible? That's you, like get, you, get a, you get a really, really big tree for like, like probably like a thousand bucks. Like a really, really big tree. They paid like literally fifth, like $25,000 per foot of that fake tree, which, is, which seems like way too much. Like, was that the decoration? They're definitely lying. But I mean, whether they're lying about the entire thing or just the price of the tree is up for debate. What I think is interesting is that all of this, like, talk about the war and Christmas and all of these, like, fake made up things that are being based on, like, one person getting their name misspelled wrong on a Starbucks cup around this holiday season or, like, one Christmas tree that they burned down themselves, like, being cited as an example. I think Bill O'Reilly might have been saying it's happening all over the country. You know, that all happens in the backdrop of, like, there being a mass pandemic going on where people are dying in the thousands or hundreds or hundreds of thousands and you know none of those things are you know like rather all of those deaths are being sort of like isolated and siloed like oh this is not an example of a failing society that's like collapsing and doesn't care about its people but a single christmas tree that was lit on fire outside of our building is actually a sign that this country is like failing and it's gonna like you know go into uh the dark ages the city that we used to love. They hate this city. I mean, honestly, like that's why they compared us to 9-11 too, because like there is this perverse part of the conservative mind that I mean, I guess the entire mind is perverse that like likes this kind of victimhood, which is why it also makes it seem like they did it themselves because like it just makes them excited to be able to like, see, we were actually targeted this time with evidence by someone. And as opposed to all the time, we're just saying we're targeted when it's just like a black person crossing the street from us or whatever. Like, so like they like when they're able to actively use some kind of thing that transgressed against them or if they can claim was transgressed against America or Christians to like ignite and like justify like their, what is usually just their victim complex. Well, it's a hate crime. Now they get to see it's, they get to say that they're a victim of a hate crime. It's like the the office clip where uh, Michael claims to be the victim of a hate crime, and he's like, "Well, I hated it. That's what defines it." I mean, that's well, that's that's basically what it is. And just re really like they're. I mean, the Kill Me makes me laugh in his like earnest stupidity, but they're not as well equipped to do this as like I, this. Kind of makes me wish Bill O'Reilly could just come back for a guest segment if this happened during his time the war on christmas like where he was really really harping on this and the tree was lit on fire i mean we would get some some fire segments from that guy no doubt about it i right. just I, I love i love their reaction to finding out that uh to uh for it to be considered a felony he needed to have put someone in harm 
like they're so outraged like uh you mean you had to he had to have uh, hurt somebody how why that's unbelievable like no it makes makes a lot of sense that lighting a tree on fire would not be considered a felony honestly i mean hate crime like what are you talking about a hate crime against us fox news like not a, not a protected class um and also yeah like it, it was it, they it, also tried to harp on the idea that it was a Christmas tree. I mean, maybe if like the person who lit it on fire had some sort of anti, uh, you know, was had so they found, discovered, and investigated, and found he had some like anti-Christian beliefs, and that's why he did this. Or even if it was like a Christmas tree belonging to a church, you could probably argue that. Um, but not because it's a Christmas tree sitting in front of like Fox. The Christmas trees are everywhere. I don't even think it was a real tree. To be honest, it was like a Christmas pole. Like, yeah, I think you at least have to be a living creature at some point. I do. I would have said I would have expected them to like try to make the Christian, like the anti-Christian thing stick, but they really just moved right on to like the personal victimhood of working at Fox News. Like you would have thought that like they would have gone down that like line of, this is just another sign that Christianity is under attack in America. That seems like more like the classic Bill O'Reilly, uh, you no. know, uh, yeah that's exactly right like they, they're this is like how sort of devoid of meaning their souls are is they they should be it should be about the christmas thing right but then they end up in but it was five hundred thousand dollars yes exactly how, how do we not punish him for the fi the the crime against five hundred thousand dollars <laughs> they let it slip what the true the true meaning of christmas is which is like in, like, incredible amounts of spending and, um, uh, yeah, and, and uh, fetishizing property. Yeah, right. I mean, but like at the same time, it's just, it's a little odd, right? You were saying, Brandon, that it, it was a Christmas pole. Do we know what the, what the, uh, what the composition of that pole was? Was it steel? Uh, because I'm not sure if simple flame can melt steel, steel beams. Actually, that's pretty, uh, that guy could have just been a Puritan because the Puritans used to set maypoles on fire and that sort of stuff. Um, I, not that this is a maypole, but it, this, so it is idolatry, uh, you know, per the Puritans, this sort of, you know, all this sort of stuff. So hmm. um, the Christmas- Well, yeah, there's no Christmas trees in the Bible. I mean, yeah, like this is like a pagan yeah. symbol from like the worship of like nature, of like nature uh, religions. And like, it's been synchronized with Christianity. So like, I mean, yeah. they, that's not the reason they didn't go into it, I don't think, but like, yeah. You know, a lot of these traditions that people swear are very meaningful about Christmas and Christ are like just, you know, repackaged Greek festivals. Maybe the right, guy I, I, I had to I had to look this up because, you know, if we're going to talk about how much this Christmas tree is worth, we need to compare it to something that everyone knows. So I looked up the the cost of the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, you know, the the arguably the most famous of the Christmas trees. Right. Can you think of one yeah. more famous? Very, very much more the fam most famous Christmas tree. Now, apparently, including all the costs in terms of uh, the, you know, getting it there, transporting it and everything, the total price for the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree is $73,500. So they're saying that their tree, their, their shitty little tree, <laughs> is worth what? How many more times is that? Five times the, 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 the cost? Oh, we got it. That's the investigation we need to do. Yeah. <laughs> some, there needs to be some insurance investigation about that, how much that tree cost and where, how it burned down. That's the false flag. That's the fault. That's the or that's the inside job, I should say. Right. Like who is going to get the money from the uh, insured Christmas tree and who's overvaluing the 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 cost of said Christmas tree for the maximum insurance payout? Hmm. It's, it's a, you know, honestly, it's, it's layers to this conspiracy. You know, they tried to disguise what is essentially just a normal grift with some kind of larger war on Christmas. It's very American. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. All right. You want to take a call, Matt? Uh, sure. Let's take a call. Uh, let's go to the phones and take 941. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey guys, my name is Bobby. I'm calling from Florida. Hey, Bobby. From and Florida. I would really, hey, I'd really appreciate if you guys would stop blowing up my spot on overselling Christmas trees to Fox News. It's kind of my <laughs> business right now. And let me tell you, I'm baby, sorry. business is booming. <laughs> so, anyways, Wait, uh, your your business is essentially selling just one Christmas tree a year and two Fox News. And that's your business. I, I mean, I'm, I'm jealous. That's, yeah, yeah. That's great. It's better than Black Friday, I'll tell you. <laughs> so thanks for taking my call. I'm calling 
uh, because I don't think people are talking about the real immigration crisis that's happening here in the United States, and that is the influx of people breaching our unsecure northern Florida border and come in just piling into the state uh, thinking that uh, Florida is an inherently red state, which it is not. Um, but thanks to Governor DeSantis, the message is getting out that uh, Florida is a conservative bastion. And <clears throat> we all know that he barely won his election and the amount of people that have died has surpassed his margin of victory. So what he's doing now is he's inviting these lunatics into the state. And we've seen with the $5,000 bonuses for cops that refuse to get vaccinated. And now with his new push to um, reinstall the state guard, I was talking to my brother and he said that he thinks that that's just a ploy to get those, you know, psychos from Michigan to move down here thinking that, oh, hey, you know, we get to be part of this new state funded militia. And so I'm looking at all of the actions that the governor is taking. And all I can think of is this is his way of trying to get to replace the voters that he killed um, so he can get reelected and then hopefully win Florida when he runs in 2024. Does that well, make any sense? Yes. I mean, I don't think it's actually, I don't think it's crazy. Like, I think he probably is encouraging uh, certain demographic shifts for his own, like, I mean, there's a wave of early retirements. Maybe people want to move down to Florida and he has the ability to, you know, like, I guess, appeal to a certain demographic. I, I I would disagree with you about saying that it's not a red state. I mean, you have two Republican governors, I mean, two Republican senators at this point, and the Republican governor, it's it's certainly trending that way. It seems oh, like- no, I, I've said, I've said uh, you know, I, I think I said it last election, if not before that, that the idea that Florida during, you know, a presidential election, the idea that Florida is a, a purple state, it can go either way is bullshit. That time has passed. I'm sorry, Florida is a solid red state now. Um, and in terms of like, yeah. spend, in spending, in terms of like spending time on the ground there to try to flip a state, I think Florida is a complete waste of time and money could be spent in other states where that's much more likely. Yeah. And that, that's a, it's, a, it's unfortunate that that is what's, what the, uh, consensus is, but we hold our governor elections in, uh, midterm years. And I think they do that for a reason because I mean, if Obama can win this state twice, uh, that that's kind of a wake up call that this isn't a red state. But I think 20, we've been 20, trending. 20, 2012 was a long time ago. I know, it was a ago. long time ago. I almost know. 10 yeah. years. Almost I know. 10 years. The state has changed. Yeah, and Donald Trump really broke everyone's brains down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's it's done, man. I'm sorry. I love I, well, I, I love Disney World. I don't know about the rest of Florida. I haven't really visited much of it. But uh I like uh, Miami it's, when it's you know when it's not the most overpriced city I've been to in, in like the in the country, but it's beautiful. It's it's uh, it's changed, man. It's it's a different place now. I mean, we could be flipping. I mean, look at what happened with Georgia. Like, why are you gonna try to? Why are you gonna try to do like? the 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 hopeful like trick shot or whatever in florida and for the off chance it could possibly like the one percent chance it could turn when you got something like you know you could flip georgia and arizona and you know uh you know and other states that are much more within that that grasp uh it, it's yeah it's and such to say i have nothing against florida i'm just talking yeah. reality here yeah i feel like it's a self-fulfilled prophecy saying things like that because the Democratic Party um, used to be existent here, and it, it, it seems like everyone's saying the same thing. There's no point in trying, and I don't want to flee my state. I'm a native, and all this makes me remember the 2008 race uh, with Ted Cruz and Beto, 
where Beto won the majority of native Texans, while Ted Cruz won a majority of non-native Texans. And I don't know. I don't know how to change uh, the narrative about Florida, but what I do know is that Republicans are <laughs> better at messaging. Um, they, they say that Florida is the freest state, but we don't have open carry. And so I think that's why they want to do the militia thing is so they can say, yeah, there's no open carry. But if you sign a list saying that you stand with the governor, we'll let you carry your guns out in has public. Any, has anyone tried you know? to change that in recent years? Has there been a push to open carry in recent years in Florida? Because it might no, just be no. it might, because it might just be the sign of the, the you know that could be one of the first signs of the ch the changeover. I mean, again, like you said, Florida wasn't always this way. So the fact that it wouldn't have open carry is not surprising. That doesn't mean it's not going to get it in the coming years. I mean, wouldn't surprise me if that's on the horizon or something. It's it's definitely one of the the the, the few states that have so far like usually you see states that are trending a certain way and they do tend to like oh look it's turning blue that's what we're used to i think but florida is the the one of those rarer states that have not only like trended red but has completely flipped i think i think it's gone honestly at least from a national race perspective i don't know about you know obviously uh, house races are different uh, senate races we've seen what happened in florida governor race we've seen that happens in florida so i don't know man beyond like the house i don't know what florida could do right now but it's it's not going in a direction that makes me hopeful for florida and again nothing against florida i'm not one of those people who post that gif of bugs bunny cutting florida off of the rest of the u.s i'm not one of those people but you know i, I i'm just talking reality here and florida without a doubt has just completely flipped it's not even it's not even close anymore i don't think I mean, I, I think, like, you got to not look at these things like red states and blue states just in the fact that, like, just because you can't get a governor or senator's seat, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden it's 100% a red state. I think stay there and continue to organize. Um, and, yeah. I mean, like, I'm from North Dakota, right? Like, I, 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 which, ironically, was a blue state when I was born and now is basically, I guess, a, quote, red state. But it's like you don't leave because fucking electoral I mean, hi, politics hi, isn't looking good right like, i agree like hyde camp uh, was a, a democrat yeah, i mean she's trash but she's yeah. trash but like point <laughs> is way to go emma <laughs> no, no 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 i know i know and that uh, dorgan was actually good feel, uh, feel good democrats in west virginia we got joe manchin i mean <laughs> so it's like you can on at, at, on a local level or at a like a you can make a, a difference on like a congressional race all this is going to be a much bigger struggle than the next electoral cycle right like uh, i so I, I think like i wouldn't get too caught up in that but i mean i wouldn't bet on you know like um getting on, on balance um the democrat winning statewide elections um all right, let's. Uh, thanks for the call, man. Um, before uh, you guys, can I uh, just shout out one podcast real quick? I'll, I'll make it real fast. Real quick. Okay, I've been listening to this podcast. It's called Doomed. It's by this guy, Matt. I think his last name is pronounced Binder. I'm not sure. Anyways, fan, it's a fantastic show. Everyone should listen to it. Uh, oh and everyone God. should sign up to his Patreon and all that. Thank you guys for taking my call. Love everything that you do. Keep it up. Appreciate what a, it. What a, great, what, what wow. a great, great caller. You know what? Florida's turning blue, baby. I can feel it. Let's <laughs> let's go, Florida. All right, let's uh, let's do another clip. Gotta do a clip. Um, just slip it into that voice. I don't even know what I'm saying. I I wonder just if we pick a clip. I wonder if the whole like um if the Disney World like lobby as as a I suspect is against the open carry thing. Cause like it's a tourist state and like nothing like, you know, tourists come from all over the country. If you're not going to want to, you know, see a bunch of kids coming from New York, I would rather kids coming from New York or whatever state that doesn't have like lax gun laws, aren't going to want to like be in Florida as much if there are just like people with AR 15s roaming around the state, even if it's not like in Disney world itself. It might, it might go to Disneyland in uh, California instead, but I've never actually been to that one. I don't know. People like the the pure the Disney purists say Disneyland is better. Here's a Disney story. Disney World sees spike in concealed firearms during the pandemic. Whoa! <laughs> so, so there you go. Yeah, that's a good call. 
All right, let's let's do this final. Why would why, why would there be a spike in concealed firearms due to the pandemic? Like, uh, the, in case they see COVID, they're gonna shoot at it. What's the what's the what's the, the, the like the, the cross? Long, keep away from me in this long line, and also DeSantis just like cementing his policies, probably. A remarkable trend considering the world's uh, so it's a spike in firearms despite the operation at reduced capacity. Um, tw at least twenty people arrested on gun charges in twenty twenty, compared with only four in twenty sixteen. Uh, 2021 is off to a record-breaking start with uh, 14. Uh, this is back in, uh, looks like in the summer. Um, and so, yeah, firearms, the fire, guns and Disney, who would have thought? Don't quite, <laughs> two American things. It looks like being a bit of a contradiction. Well, I'm assuming they, they know because they probably have exact points of reference because they probably turn all those people away, right? I'm assuming you can't actually go, like Disney World has their own set of laws. So if they don't want even, uh, you know, guns, no matter what the law of the state is, if they right. don't want guns in the Disney World property, they could easily just uh, say no, which I'm assuming they do because that would go against their whole their whole gimmick. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's turn to this... Uh... This clip's a few days old, but I wanted to get to it. Um, obviously, we're seeing throughout the country this push, particularly on sta on the state level, for anti-critical race theory legislation. And there has been a lot of reporting on how a lot of this effort is astroturfed. Coke money coming in, a, a breath of GOP money also uh, buttressing it. And... While there is an organic desire to ban critical race theory that I you know fomented by right wing media, but like there are people who are who are um, genuinely invested in it, it has been amplified and and has just exploded because of this money, and a lot of that is driven by state and local politicians who are helping this effort along, including this New Hampshire state representative, Erica Layton. She was asked by a local reporter there named Adam, Adam Sexton about the uh, anti-critical race theory bill that's going through the New Hampshire state house right now. Listen to her answer on uh, what she, be how, how she believes that under her new educational system that she's envisioning, how the three-fifths compromise would be taught if basically the concept of racism is not allowed to be taught in schools. If this became law, what would be the appropriate way for a teacher to address something like the three-fifths compromise in the Constitution, which basically invalidated the humanity of enslaved people who were black in, in America? I mean, th that's a racist aspect of America's founding. Is that run afoul somehow to bring this up in the classroom? Well, when you're bringing this up in the classroom, you should go back to some of the historical documents. Um, the Three-Fifths Compromise actually made it so that the slaveholding South didn't have more of a voice in Congress. They actually were worried that if, for representation, they counted each slave as, an, as a whole vote and a whole voter, that then there might be more slavery throughout the country. And that it would be unequal, not it would be unequal because a viewpoint that was on its way out would be overrepresented. <laughs> so, the idea of saying that somebody is less than a human is abhorrent. It's terrible. It's something that we shouldn't do. They were trying to figure out how to have a representative democracy without having a toxic view take hold and overwhelm. Toxic the rest view. Of this new, new pause view. it. I'm sorry. Just pause it really quickly. It gets a lot worse. But just the idea that this was like the, the passivity with which she treats treats slavery as just a viewpoint, a toxic view that was on its way out. It was not a viewpoint. It was the foundation of an economic system that benefited like countless wealthy landowners and property owners in this country. And that's why there had to be even a compromise about this. And I, I just think like, on the way on the way out, uh, I think like close to like what eighty ninety years it took between what they're talking about and then yeah. it being on the way out. On this way out. 
<laughs> I just I think like the question the problem is kind of in the question too like they didn't do that just to invalidate their humanity they did it to empower the slave um, plantation class with uh, by recognizing their humanity at a discount and saying oh that we're gonna count them and you can tell the way she says like as recognized as vote like oh they clearly weren't given a vote were they right but they wanted to give that population so the southern states weren't just completely swamped by the northern states that yeah. was, it was clearly just to empower slave owning uh the slave owning class that's that's why it was it and and like it did invalidate their humanity right but i think like that's not why they did it and i think we need to have a more clear-eyed view of why these things were done she, she yeah. also okay go on brandon oh, no i'm just gonna say it's just interesting because a you know you're right matt it's like it was three-fifths they were counted as three-fifths of a person in the population they weren't given three-fifths of a vote they yeah. were just they you know they were just allowed right. as a population in the south to pretend like they had more people because the south was largely just you know a few plantations a few like white workers and the slave population was getting larger than the white population so it makes more sense the only thing i would say is that like they framed this as though like oh it's a lesson in history it was something that's going to be that was going to be phased out we wouldn't want people rather you know it's implied that it would just taint people's view of america in a way that would make them less patriotic in some sense because i think part of why people get caught up in this is that because like you know the founding of America is treated as such an important thing because, you know, in our politics, you got to have that American exceptionalism uh, myth hammered into your head that like any of the genocides that we did in order to establish America, native populations, uh, you know, slavery, black people, you know, et cetera, are viewed in sort of just a sort of that thing had to happen in order to get to America. So how bad can it be? just throughout history and how we understand history and how we understand genocides too are often framed in that context of like well this genocide was necessary to for, you know to form a western country versus another genocide that was somehow anomalous to you know the standards of western countries or the standards that we eventually decided to hold western countries too like apartheid you know and obviously people talk about uh palestine and israel as well in this sort of context of like you know how do we get people to understand that genocide is bad and not just like make excuses for certain types of genocide or certain types of human rights violation if they're put as like into this timeline of american history the only other part of that too is that like it's put in this timeline in american history to pretend like it's not still happening but we know that in the south they expand like you know they expand their population numbers by counting prisoners in prisons in certain counties in the South, which is why they build them and build them big to inflate their population numbers as well. So yep. they're still doing stuff like this. So yep. not teaching it in the past it has the direct effect on how people understand what's going on currently in our system because it's still happening. And so, so, that, like, it's, so that's the point. I mean, well, exactly. I, I, I would just, uh, I, exactly, Brandon, and I would just enlarge on the point. We have this um, blog from a Luke O'Neill substack, and I'll just uh, read a section of it here. For example, 60% of Illinois prisoners are from Cook County, Chicago, yet 99% of them are counted outside the county. Pretty slick shit, right? First, you arrest predominantly black people from large population centers that tend to vote Democrat. Next, you cage them in more rural places where the prisoners are thereby inflating that district's raw representational power. Now, areas who rely on prisons for jobs and power and wealth can have a leg up on passing legislation that will send more black people into those same prisons in a massive feedback loop of disenfranchisement. And then he, he uh, um, editorializes, understanding all that, you might get why Republicans are so fucking afraid of kids being taught how our country actually works and how it has always been for centuries of cheating to ensure entrenched ma uh, minority rule by depriving as many people as possible besides white Christian conservatives uh the power that to vote and yeah yeah I mean, it's, so uh, not ancient history at all is very much still a part of our electoral politics well well yeah. let's like, let her finish her her answer here because i honestly it gets worse from that i just wanted to take the time to to dissect the first part of her answer the second part is so explicitly counter like just false that it, it obviously it, it um, as i mentioned it gets worse a representative democracy without having a toxic view take hold and overwhelm the rest of this new, new forming country. It was rational, but it was also racist though, right? I mean, it, it, it's not a well, good thing to do. If you look at it, you know, it wasn't, it was all slaves. So when you had indentured slaves that were coming over from Ireland, they also counted as three fifths. No. Nope. Uh, my family, the Indians, I'm part Cherokee. Um, we were also counted as three fifths within that. No. So it wasn't good. But it, when you look at what else was happening in the world at the time, you didn't have representative democracies. 
Okay, yeah. So uh, that literally is exactly what Branding was saying, right? The formation of America justifies all of this. And so she, she that, that was perfect. I don't think you've seen the clip before. So there you go. But that is not true. Indentured servants were explicitly excluded from the three-fifths uh, compromise in that area. And she calls them indentured slaves. She really is comparing the indentured servitude of, say, like her, what she said, Irish people. That is not accurate. Oftentimes, like indentured servitude was a way to serve the capitalist class as well. Yes. But they also had the ability to then once they graduated from that indentured servitude, then that would often turn into apprenticeships. And it was a way for there to be like a semblance of upward mobility for basically only white people. That's yeah. what the reality yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, if you survived a year period of indenture, which wasn't the case um, typically early on, then you would, um, yeah, get some, uh, a lot more rights. And and, and this was true of even uh, black people too. Like there were um, p folks who got the freedom and of course, eventually a racialized, um, a, a more hyper racialized version of slavery emerged and from the plantation system. All right, well, then good. We can move on from well, that. You know, I just think that we have to acknowledge the existence of the Black Irish if we're going to, you know, <laughs> be a unified left. Also, but, I, I, I black took back Irish what I said. Erasure. I didn't realize she was a POC, so, um, you know, she's... she's I mean, that's... I, 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 I have zero faith. That, I mean, like, who's more uh, Native American, that woman or Elizabeth Warren? Like, let's let's be real oh, here. Oh, bringing up the old school beef. No, it's, it's never it's never a low blow to remind people about that one. That was that was funny because people got really yeah. really like people got really invested in how reasonable a lie that was to tell. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, the lies that are reasonable to tell yourself and tell your friends, you know, as like trying to prove you're interesting, are not reasonable to, to tell the entire population. You just got to know the difference. Yeah. But I mean, I would also just say like it's amazing how little you know, Americans know about their own history and the history of the world to allow, you know, people to say stuff like that. Like America was actually pretty progressive for the time when it comes to things like race and democracy. It's like, I don't know about that. Depending on what time that you mean, America, like I think was the last, one of the last countries to uh, abolish slavery. And it's like to, in terms of its, um, on its home soil. And they had to fight a whole war about, a war about it. It's like, so a lot of the, you know, the myths, or rather the myth of American exceptionalism, I think is one of the most pervasive conspiracy theories that Americans are taught because it does really alienate them from the rest of the world by having such a poor grasp on like where they're situated in so many of these things, not even just in terms of what's going on in their own country, but like, yeah, you know, them uh, Americans thinking they're better than everyone else is like rel relies on them not knowing anything about anywhere else or themselves, which is kind of hard to, you know, come to terms with, but like stuff like this, where it's like, okay, well, they don't want you to know what's going on in the past. So you don't know what's going on in the present. So you don't realize just how little we've at progress we've actually made compared to what's going on in the rest of the entire world. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like an open air prison here. Well, they want, I mean, that's the explicit project of this anti-critical race theory stuff is they want to rewrite history because it's so unfavorable to conservatives. You can uphold American exceptionalism and by like just as a as a, a twin effect uphold white supremacy and a completely revisionist history of racism that allows people to like naturalize the conditions that we're currently living under today that's the entire point and i would just encourage you know reporters get a little bit more savvy about what this is doing for power right like yeah. why why is this being pursued for power as opposed to like i i agree like the like the the um the way he put it what do you say like um invalidate He's a local their humanity reporter, right? I mean... and, but like and that's the register we're taught to speak in these things but we're, that's still kind of on a more individualistic almost um uh, uh register of things this stuff was done it's conspiracy yeah. right by power yeah, definitely. And I think part of that conspiracy is like, you know, not part of it, but a lot of it has to do with muddying the waters around stuff. Like it was, she mentioned there, like, he was like, is it, was it racist? He's like, I don't know if you would call having slaves of a particular race racist, <laughs> but, certain, but certainly, you know, it was not good. And like the continued muddying of these waters surrounding what it means to be racist, what it means to be sexist, what it means to be, you know, like both. And also like the relationship that, that has to like power, as Matt said, in capitalism as a function of power 
power as well, you know, or power function of capitalism as well, is all obscured at this like the lowest levels by like being unable to even like admit that like slavery was a bad thing that happened and was done specifically to people of a specific race for a specific, you know, economic and social purpose, <laughs> you know, and that's what makes it racist at the, you know, not just at the personal level of like the very specific slave owners, which we're trying to, which I mean, honestly, we, we muddied the waters around whether like they're racist or not through like the vehicle of talking about the founding fathers and like how they did some good things and bad things yeah but you know just generally like the entire project of like america whether or not you know we understand what racism means as not necessarily like an intellectual and moral failure of people individually or even an intellectual moral failure of like a country but like these like sort of systems that are like in play to maintain power yep 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 all right, let's and to the and to the really quick to that the what we what was brought up at the end there about like it was this like a local news reporter, like oddly enough I think it's even more important that local news reporters get with it in terms of like these things because a lot of these people who don't trust like the media for some reason or another still trust their like local news outlets like their local affiliates, um, so the fact that they so often sort of drop the ball on these more like, you know, these issues where it requires some sort of a beyond local, uh, you know, uh, 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 mindset, I guess you can say, to try to, you know, you know, to, to, to approach certain topics. I, I think they need to get better with that for sure. It's, it, this often happens where they just drop the ball completely on like just, just talking to a local person or a local politician. No need to put this in the context of the broader like uh, beliefs or ideologies that are spreading throughout the country. Just, you know, just a local news thing. Mm. I would agree. I also think that, you know, some people are just generally unprepared, not to make excuses for anybody because, you know, the local filtering to the global, you know, that sort of pipeline is, you know, important to understand, but, you know, I could imagine being surprised by how shameless some of these people are about stuff like this, <laughs> you know, like, just like how, like when someone tells you like, well, slavery wasn't racist, basically to your face, just like being, and you shouldn't be surprised, that's just our country, but like, you know, you would be surprised that, that I think the depth that these Republicans will say, you know, what will come out of their mouths in terms of just like how divorced they are from reality and also common decency, but you gotta be prepared, you gotta be prepared for that, you know, you can't just be like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So you really don't think this is true. Hmm. Okay. Like, because like, yeah, you know, then it just becomes a, he said, she said, kind of like our, you know, interview. All right. Congressional baseball fan. It's been sad to see Fox Plaza become the scene of such an act of violence and worse than it's, uh, than that. It's not been properly investigated. What's really going on with Fox and friends. They're out of control. Of course, I'm talking about investigating how those army druggers ended up behind Pete Hagseth's axe throwing target. Uh, <laughs> Fox Plaza truthers know it was an inside job. If people haven't seen that, there's a, there's a Fox and friends segment from, I don't know, maybe five years or so ago where they're throwing axes mm. and Pete Hagseth throws one and it sails over the target and hits a guy uh, fucking drumming, a drummer. And it is a very unpleasant now. video. Like, it honestly makes me cringe to think about now because he might have been really hurt. I think he, I think he, he sued. He sued, yeah. Um, I mean, you could have you could have dismembered somebody with that. I know, yeah. I, that's oh, my what... God. How did, I, how did I miss this? I'm looking for the video right now. How did I? <laughs> Jeez. That's why, like those. I mean, I'm. I love bowling and like group, like activities Bowling's like that. Great. But the the but bowling is wonderful. But the um the like axe throwing fad is not really my thing. I I don't know how I I don't know how they ensure it. Like it just seems like okay, let's get drunk and throw axes. Yeah, it seems like a <laughs> massive liability. I've been I, I've been there actually. I, I was one of I wouldn't say the first people to get on the trend because I knew somebody who uh like was working at the the Brooklyn version. Like I don't know what it's called. The uh, like kick axe or whatever like the franchise of axe throwing uh places is and it, it gave me a little anxiety to do it because i'm just yeah. i was just like sure it was going to bounce back i was like it's just going to bounce back like in a cartoon and like it hit yeah. me in the shoulder it never happened but you know you just can never i think fully escape that you know mentality and i'm just waiting for a wave of those videos to drop online like the kick axe challenge or whatever and on tiktok and just like a bunch of shoulders just with axes cleaved into the collarbone I did do it once, but like not by choice. I was, it was like my, the, a 
the after party for my stepbrother's graduation and like i remember my my dad got paired with uh, some one of his friends family members was in the nfl as an offensive lineman and he had to compete against that guy and that was pretty funny uh he was like 300 pounds could not be stronger axe goes right in um but anyway the, I, I I didn't I didn't realize it was like a because that was in Nashville. I did not realize it was like all over Brooklyn and and, and there's like these places you can do in Jersey too. It it was just anyway it's shocking to me. Okay, um, train boy, the Irish love being indentured servants. Have you met an Irish person? They're practically built for it. I don't get that joke. Um, I don't know if that's right to say, train boy. Um. Magic Wand, what is a Brooklyn dad defiant? Is that Sam? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Mini Doctor says, Emma, remind everyone to hit the like button. Hit the like button. Hit the like button. Hit the like button. Please. Um, oh, come all ye fascists. Says, uh, Thor I don't know how to say that. Make me say weird things like poop says also can i get a shofar for my engagement to my beautiful girlfriend again we don't have the soundboard so this is on that now that was a sad one i was taken back by the name a little bit like you get a shofar for an engagement and make me say things like poop they, they, sometimes i don't know if it's like the name or something like, like the actual body of text that emma's about to start reading because there's like no, a lot of names are just whole sentences now yeah i mean it's and make me w say weird things like poop has written in many times uh today as a michigan dirt <laughs> person also says florida can also can have our psychos i live 10 minutes from a twice weekly trump protest for something I-5, the Christmas tree is decidedly pagan and has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. So maybe it was a uh, a, a Christian who set it on fire. That's what because... I'm saying. It was a Puritan. Mm -hmm. There you go. Wyoming Ryan, why did, what do they do with the tree after Christmas? I bet they burn it. Sure as hell can't replant it. Nug Wrangler, in order to reignite the war on Christmas, it had to be a half a million dollar tree. P people aren't going to war over a $300,000 tree. Come on. Vigilin podcast idea says Thor again. I can't say this one. Thor and T, the M majority resport. It's a little convoluted. All right, uh, Bender, you want to take a uh, you want to take a call? Sure. Let's go to. Uh... Wow, we're already at two sixteen. Maybe we take like two quick calls and then we're done. Sounds good. Eight oh two. What's your name? Where you where are you calling from? Hi, is this me? This is you. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, uh, this is Felix from Manhattan. Hey, Felix. What's up? Thanks for taking my call. Uh, and I'm glad I got through on a day that Bender's here. Because um, I just have a really quick thing to get your thoughts on regarding crypto. Oh, um, well, I don't know if it's As you quick, might know. This, but... <laughs> Go ahead. I mean, my thing is quick, and I can take my answer off there. Sure. Um, but so I've noticed this interesting trend where... During the pandemic, there was a bit of a boom in online chess um, between like the Queen's Gambit and a bunch of online streaming. Yeah. Um, it's been kind of everywhere. And sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Um, no, okay. I, and I will say that I. I what's been interesting. Oh, go, go on. I'm oh, sorry. I'm not here to pick a fight about is chess a sport because. No, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going to engage yeah. in. Yeah, keep going. Sorry. Um, and what's, what's interesting is that there's been a bunch of these online tournaments with like a ton of prize money and like, I mean, the content of a chess celebrity is ridiculous, but pretty famous people within this world competing. And every single one I've seen is sponsored by some crypto related company mm -hmm. um, to the point where they had a literal tournament they called the Crypto Cup, where they gave out like something like tens of thousands of dollars prizes all in Bitcoin. And everything from like youtube videos to streamers to these tournaments to like the literal world championship going on right now is all sponsored by like coinbase and all these crypto related companies um and i mean the world of professional chess is a really kind of messed up and like i don't know very capitalistic thing but it's just interesting how ubiquitous this is in that world 
I um, just want to get your thoughts on that. I'll take yeah. my answer off there. Thanks for okay. my call. I mean, one, uh, chess is not a sport. Uh, two, uh, it is like a great game, though. And I w I'm not shocked that there's some sort of overlap just because, like, it, I'm not saying I, 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 I like chess and I know like people in my life who love chess who are not libertarian types, but like something about the nature of chess and it's, um, I, I doesn't shock me and how that there's maybe some overlap with crypto bros is all I'm going to say. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't actually familiar with, uh, this, so I'm, I'm glad that you let me know so I can look into this further. Um, in terms of like all this crypto sponsorship infiltrating the chess world. Um, but I mean, yeah, they're, they're looking to put their name when I mean, I want to say they, I'm talking about crypto companies and, and players in that industry. They're looking to put whatever they're hawking on everything and they've got the money to do it because, you know, they're just, they, they, they basically just make it up. I mean, uh, they need money. They love. They, you know, they have. They have. They have plenty of. You know. A. They have a lot of money in actual uh, successful crypto, and then B. They if they start something, they just sell the tokens for it in advance, which then gives them an influx of money too. So they're just rolling in money, and their number. The one thing they can't buy is why you see all these ads. The one thing they cannot buy is legitimacy. It's why they are spending, why crypto.com is spending all this money to put their name on the Staples Center, well, formerly known as the Staples Center, now the crypto.com arena. Um, it's because they cannot get the, the, people still don't look at them as a legitimate thing. Um, you know, and they're, they're tired of it. They want that acceptance. That's wow. why, you know, this, this, um, you know, this, the, the whole way they used to sell themselves is we want to get around the major finance players. We want to take away from that old money and give everyone the ability to, uh, you know, take control of their finances without the big banks getting in the way. Yet, whenever a big bank declares that they are going to, you know, uh, mess around in the crypto world, they throw their, you know, they throw confetti in the air and throw a party and celebrate because it's giving them legitimacy in their eyes. That's all they really want right now. So they can make even more money than they currently do is that legitimacy. And it's the one thing that they cannot buy. Uh, so that's, that's my thoughts on that in a general sense, but I have to look more into the chess thing. Cause that's, that's pretty yeah. interesting. I mean, like any pyramid scheme, it is uh, fatally dependent on continuing to grow. And yep. once it doesn't continue to grow, there's not going to be any new no, new money to uh, leave somebody holding a worthless bag, which is, again, the entire point of all this shit. Like, oh, I'm going to be the last one holding the Lazy Lion NFT. Okay, guess what? You're, fu you're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you have that um, rights to that image somehow. But uh, that I'm, I think the person that's even more glad is the person who you gave your money to. Watch the Lula Row documentary and then like, uh, just copy and paste it onto what happened. What's happening with crypto? It's basically the same thing. It's the, like all those MLMs are. Jordan Belfort is um yeah a crypto guy now. And I see people are mad about my chess take. I'm sorry, guys. Like it's a difficult game, but a sport requires physical exertion and like not, and a sport requires like the physical exertion to be what and what what determines the outcome of the competition as opposed to like just purely mental exertion and that's why gaming isn't a sport either so Ooh, i don't yeah. know I, I would consider gaming under even under those to be because it, it is more active than it's not just brain activity that's well it's all okay maybe just okay finger activity i don't consider physical exertion but maybe i don't know enough about gaming i think gaming there's more of a case to be made I, I, mean, I think I think it doesn't matter. I think ultimately, like people want to call it a sport for the legitimacy, calling something a sport has, and so you think it's impressive versus any kind of real, like you know, qualifying criteria of a sport per se. Like, because for me, I agree with you. I'm, I'm like, I don't think gaming is a sport. I don't think like chess or board it's games difficult. are difficult either. You and know, they're competitive. But yeah, yeah. exactly. Something so being Emma, difficult doesn't make it a sport. You know, something being like requiring like mental or physical like alacrity doesn't make it a sport. Even it being a competition doesn't make it a sport. Some games are sports. I mean, games are competitions by necessarily uh, by necessary uh, quality, I guess. So, you know, some people, some person wins, some person doesn't. You know, most games are, I guess. So like, you know, we have to have some level of 
distinguishing but i think people you know people fight for the right to be called a sport because it gives legitimacy to like them in the eyes of the public whether whether gaming professionally should have that legitimacy is debatable but still <laughs> no chess so maybe. i just want to get this clear between emma and brandon a sport requires the physical exertion aspect i would go so far to say <laughs> sorry no just quit the physical exertion to be directly connected to the outcome of of the competition well, I, Brandon said competition is not necessary. Well, so here's the thing. I Emma, I think, has a full definition of what she considers to be a sport, what she does not. I'm just going based on gut feeling. Like for me, basketball, sports, soccer, sports, swimming, sport, bowling, not a sport. Uh, you know, uh, I think darts, bowling's a sport. No, see, that, see this, this is where we're going to disagree. Like, I, my gut says bowling, not a sport. Impressive? Yes. An activity where there's a winner and loser? Yes. Sport? No. Pool? Not a sport. Uh, you know, this, hmm. but this is just me being like a hard ass weightlifting. I would say weightlifting. I don't know if that's, you know, sometimes I'm split on top. Oh yeah. I'm split on that. Sometimes it depends. Huh? It really depends. You know, I'm, I'm in many ways a purist, but also have no real, uh, definition to provide for anybody. So, but this is online. So like, I think people are used to that, like poorly defined <laughs> terms and just like, but yeah, feelings. I don't know if you, sh you, it can be considered a sport if you're sitting down. Uh, well, I shouldn't, I'm sorry. That's not true. I've had the Paralympics. I'm, I'm all in favor of that and stuff. I just, I gotta, I gotta move on or I'm going to like get in trouble or something. All right. Well, the, reason, the reason, the reason I asked though, is because some of your definitions, uh, to me, it sounds like that, uh, pro wrestling is a sport, uh, but that's cool. I, yeah, I, I some, agree. Let's go. Some types of, some types stupid, of, but it is a sport. I would say some types of wrestling our sports pro wrestling is an activity oh there's no doubt about it that, like collegiate like amateur wrestling is a sport that's 100 percent. but pro wrestling is uh is sports entertainment i will be honest um, i don't i don't even like sports so like this is again even more uninformed but just me like grasping at like whatever sports i think maybe i'm basing on popularity um, although i would say if a board game was going to be a sport scrabble or bananagrams would be the one i think of or maybe one of like the act you know like uh what's one where you ask like pictogram or whatever it's called where you like have to act things out charades versions of games those could be yeah. sports too also operation total sport absolutely uh, and also the game mafia where you go around in a circle and you have to like pick who is like is actually the killer you know i know yeah i know that one <laughs> did, did you dra take drama <laughs> games are also yeah drama games are also sports <laughs> um unless you're sitting down of course apparently we're, we move past we're, that. We're, we're, we're going to get lots of emails from rowers. A lot of uh, rowing people. Oh, are going to be very oh, angry. oh, I don't. Ooh, well, that's, wait, do, we have, do we have time for that? This is harder than I thought. All right, uh, Bender, final call of the day, and then we'll read some IMs and get out of here. All right, let's do it. Uh, let's go to uh, 647. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is uh, Warren from Toronto. Hey, Warren from Toronto. What's up? Hey, everybody. So uh, good show today. I'll be quick. I just wanted to kind of call attention to the election that's going on in the Philippines right now, mm -hmm. because I think it really hits on a lot of themes that your show's great on hitting on. So, for example, you know, just the lack of accountability towards uh, politicians, you know, like George H.W. Bush, who probably should have faced great consequences for the Iraq war and now are being rehabilitated. And right now in the Philippines, the person who is one of the front runners is uh, Bong Bong Marcus, Ferdinand Marcus Jr. Um, Bong Bong's his nickname. And his father is Ferdinand Marcus, uh, the previous dictator who declared martial law for about 10 years, was good buddies with Reagan, um, numerous human rights at atrocities, kleptocrats, stole a lot of money. And while he did face some penal consequences, most, most of his family, which after he was gone, retained some power in the Philippines, continued to be corrupt, but ruled an entire area. And so right now, Bong Bong, uh, he's leading, he's allying with um, Duter Duterte's daughter, the last president, mm. who's running to be VP. It's a separate election, but they're teaming up. And I, I think, number one, it shows kind of like a, a leftover colonial effect from the states. But I also think it's important is, aside from just the importance of holding people accountable, because Marcus was elected as governor uh, when his father was president. So even though he was only 23 and young, he, he was so relevant, he downplays the atrocities his father did. 
And also, just like how Duterte was elected, a lot of this is based on disinformation just spread by Facebook. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'll be quick. I just kind of wanted to flag that for everyone and how it's something to watch because it really ties with the themes of politician accountability. And if you don't take a stand and hold people accountable, well, guess what? Decades later, a reclamation project is very possible. And uh, also just how these big tech companies really destroy democracy. So, uh, yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave that out. Peace out, everybody. Thanks for the call. I just want to say, uh, you know, we, 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 we very badly need some good nicknames in our U.S. politics. Bong Bong is his nickname. That's, that's great. When's the last time we had a good nickname for a, a, a candidate or a politician? I'm trying to think. Ike, well, maybe? I mean, we have to go that far back? Is Newt? Had- I'm going to say most of them have the same nickname, Hansy or like racist. So, <laughs> <laughs> so really, which is a lot of uh, reuse. I was a lot like what it was. What's tip short for? Tipper. Like I am now I'm looking up Tip O'Neill. Like I'm just trying oh. to think what his Thomas. That's a, that's mm. a, yeah. It's just like too. It's preppy. been a while though. It's been a while, right? When was that? So for a tip T.I. Harris. Uh, yeah, I guess that's that was a while ago. Um, Infertile Turtle says, ableist Emma canceled. All right, yes, I deserve it, fine. Ooh. Is cheerleading a sport? I can't, I can't. Cheerleading is a sport. Uh, I, again, at, but only at the highest levels. I very, do. Think, I, yeah, I think it's a sport at a high level. Sometimes, if you've seen Bring It On, you'd know that some cheerleading teams are better than the football teams that they, that they cheer for. And in those cases, the cheerleading is the sport and the football is not. <laughs> Yeah, is that is there like yeah that that I I watched Bring It On recently. I don't know how well it's aged. Uh, like the I it, it the 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 white savior sh- sh- shtick is is pretty pretty terrible. <laughs> Although Kirsten Dunst underrated perpetually in my uh, great opinion. in um oh the movie on becoming a god in Central Florida. Speaking of uh, of uh, pyramid schemes and multi level marketing, she's been killing it. And I know you don't watch Fargo because it's too close to home, literally. But uh, she's great in Fargo too. Um, oh, I she's in the she's in the Fargo show. I didn't know that. Yeah, once like the 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 cast changes every season. She's uh, I think in season two, really yeah, good. Have to check it out. Really I think good. bring it up. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I think Bring It On holds up uh, pretty well. I've seen it recently too, and I'm trying to compare it to like the other similar movies I've seen, like Pitch Perfect and like Glee recently. Oh. But that's a movie. And I'm like, I think Bring It Up, Bring It On holds up, holds on to some of its charm because at the end, no spoiler, but for Bring It On, they still lose. Like you know, like the team that they were that they were stealing from all those years wins this time, and they lose. Uh, so you know, I think they address the white savior stuff a little better. They do, than... It's just they don't give. I mean, look, I'm like I shouldn't be lecturing about this, but like I just I f- find it annoying that they don't give the like black team any characterization until they basically win the competition. And you know, hey, the... that's when you get characterized. You got to win first. All right. All right. Yeah. I don't. I can't. Forget, I can't remember what happens in the sequels. There's like 27 sequels to bring it on. I've only seen a few of them. So yeah, I, I don't think that's been expanded like upon. Have you seen the Hayden Panettiere one? And it's uh, she is not a good dancer. <laughs> I don't know. I think that like the movie I look to for that kind of dynamic. Not, not that we're going off. We're going a little bit off of the topic. Is like Save the Last Dance with Julia Stiles oh, and that. Yeah. Like, that's kind of oh, yeah. the one about like oh so okay. <laughs> oh, no. oh no, yeah, not good. I should watch White that one. That's great. Oh. It, great in a different sense. White communist says the white supremacist denial nonsense about Irish indentiture needs to be trashed. Um, but, but sorry, I would say they don't even. I mean, the thing about our our like our leaders too is that sometimes the only thing that like they are against like Irish people too though. I mean, the the Republicans put out that when when Beto O'Rourke was running, they had that whole anti Irish campaign against him. Uh, where like the, yeah. the take Patrick's Day one. Oh my God, that was such a uh, that was a great, but such a like a oh. weird ad they ran. Those St. Patrick's Day one against Beto, where they had him like his mugshot from being arrested for like uh, DUI or whatever he was arrested for, and they had put like the, the leprechaun hat on him, and they were just like this this St. Patrick's Day don't be like Beto. I was like wow. Yeah. Um, the white communist says the white supremacist denial nonsense about Irish indenture needs to be trashed by the late 1600s, a hundred years before the three fifths compromise, Virginia and Maryland codified prototype Nuremberg laws that constructed white people, Irish included as a separate class of colonists who had human rights as opposed to Negroes who, uh, now would 
inherits have inherited slave status. The result was that the contemporary African Americans had limited indenture contracts changed into lifetime and all your children's children radic- uh, racialized slavery. The yeah. Irish did not. In fact, the Irish helped enforce this tyranny. And, and also it's important to realize too, that there was like a scientific aspect that went along with that. You know, again, a lot of which was pioneered by our fa- our founding fathers with um, I, Thomas Jefferson who wrote the notes on the Commonwealth of Virginia where like the first like real race science, you know, that was from the mm-hmm. American School of Anthropology where like, you know, people like Thomas Jefferson sketched out a version of, you know, human taxonomy that like essentially was a spectrum in terms of like white Europeans, and depending on what part of Europe you were from, you might dis- you might decide, you know, it was French white Europeans versus English white Europeans or, you know, German versus that. But like, you know, at some point that like there was a spectrum of, you know, inherent qualities that people of different races had, and you can like map it onto a hierarchy. And that's what makes it racist. And like, ultimately speaking, we were the prime architects of that as a country. And like it, our continued sort of distance from that doesn't change how pervasive it still is in our society. Uh, we're going to do like five more and then get out of here. Avelino Gracia says that Kirsten Dunst made a terrible Mary Jane. All right. Please don't. Please. The first two Spider-Men are actually, or man movies are great. And I saw, I retweeted it today. People pointing out how like in the for, in the Spider-Man movies with Tobey Maguire, he's like, his poverty is like central to the story. And he's always just struggling financially. And how in the new MCU, the Spider-Man's just like jetting off with Tony Stark and getting hundreds of thousands of dollars willy nilly. I mean, that speaks to the MCU's problems, honestly. Also, and I would say just to that point, like, I don't like Kirsten Dunst in the first two Spider-Mans either, but I would defend it. And like, that's just a different type of movie. Like Marvel movies now, everyone has to be joking all the time. And there is no, there's no like funny character. Spider-Man isn't funnier than the people around him or like more quirky people around him. Like everyone's cracking wise 24-7. You know, Hulk is cracking wise, Spider-Man's cracking wise, Thor is cracking wise. At least back in like, you know, the comic books and also back in those movies, like, you know, Spider-Man was uniquely weird and has own personality versus like you know yeah mary jane was a little bland you know aunt may was kind of just like just your typical like movie old person with wisdom and they were like more stereotypes but you know of like movie characters or archetype movie characters but it was a comic book movie and at least they were distinct archetypes versus like everyone is the wise cracker everyone has the jokes like a la joss whedon buffy because he's you know he's the archetype of that uh, movie universe Wow, we yeah, have I, news. Sorry, thank you so much for Margo from Mass from writing in. Buffalo Starbucks Union succeeded. Oh, not sure if yeah, you missed I, it already. I sent that to you guys in the uh, the chat. The uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. There's a video of them celebrating too. Oh, I it, I just I didn't even see the I didn't click on the link, so I, I didn't see the preview. Thank, uh, that's really really exciting. I mean. Awesome. The first in the the first the first ever Starbucks to unionize. Pretty cool. That's amazing. All right, we're gonna read three more and then get out of here. Um, I just want to say that I love the first two Spider-Man movies too. In fact, I even like uh, number three with uh, minus all the all the the Topher Grace Venom stuff. Thomas, I mean, Hay- Thomas Hayden Christensen, whatever his name is, it makes a great Sandman. To be honest, I thought I he was like, great. Uh, well, you like the parts where, like, Peter Parker gets emo and dances on the street? All right, that, that, that's a little bit much. But, that was, you know, that was, that was Sam Raimi being a little bit silly, I think. I, I, th- I mean, I don't know whose idea that was, but I will defend it because it was part of a movie universe that was interested in having fun. You know, I feel like there's like, I feel like we've gone to a point where Marvel movies, maybe not the new Spider-Man ones, I kind of think that they're all right, but like Marvel movies now feel so much more overwhelmingly like products that are insisting that you take them seriously at yeah. art. Like they're like, oh no, this is an algorithm that we've created, but we demand you take it seriously as art. Where at least like Sam Raimi as a director, like, you know, I make fun stuff, you know, not every, not every movie has to be an artistic project in the sort of like the grand scheme of like cinema. But if you can make a movie that comes together as fun, you know, it's fun. Like, you know, no one will, no one will defend like the first Spider-Man as like an important like piece of cinema the way they should. But at least we don't have people like talking about how like the Eternals is the most revolutionary movie in the history of the world or something. All right, three more, and we are getting out. J bags, crazy fact: chess players can burn six thousand calories during a day of tourney play. They're constantly clenched, breathing hard through fast rates, and their brains are mostly. The most energy hungry organ are working overtime. Ultimately, with you, that's not a sport, but it's hardly passive. I never said it was passive. Anyway, 12, uh, 12 8 was an inside job, says Jay Bags. Okay, the, uh, the uh, very funny. 
I think um, it's hole seven, but you know, yeah, you're, well, you're in the right place. Um, Rory Gatto, MCA, MCU is whack, yo. And the final I am of the day. Congressional baseball fan, blank as a sport is the new hot dog as a sandwich, which of course inevitably is going to lead to a political compass of what is a sport. Uh, this has been the most controversial MR fun half in a while. Well, I would agree with that. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Awesome show today. Appreciate all you. We will see you tomorrow for Casual Friday. Peace. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there